Hello mountain bikers, e-bikers, e-bike haters, and all other two-wheeled enthusiasts. Welcome to Vital's 2024 SL e-bike test sessions. Boom, 10 to 15 second sizzle. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. oh, wow, we're good. You all right? For those that don't know, Test Sessions has long been Vital's way of placing a bunch of similar bikes head to head to see where each excels and what sets them apart. The goal is to help riders determine which bike best suits their needs, riding style, and terrain. This year, we gathered up a pile of SLE bikes, three testers, and spent a week zipping around the hills of Northern California to figure out what makes each bike tick. From motor feel to battery life, to maneuverability and stability at speed, to small intricacies like display and app usability, charging interface, or cable routing, we put each bike through the ringer. I'm Jason Schroeder, and I'm joined by Vital Tech Editor Johnny Simonetti and camera guy extraordinaire turned e-bike connoisseur Lear Miller, and this is Vital's SL e-bike test sessions. So what is an SL e-bike? SL, or super light, has become the widely adopted nomenclature to distinguish e-bikes that are slimmer and less powerful than the typical e-bike. Full-size e-bikes generally have a motor with around 85 newton meters of torque paired with a 600 to 900 watt hour battery and weigh 50 plus pounds. SL e-bikes typically have compact motors with 50 to 60 newton meters of torque paired with a 300 to 430 watt hour battery and weigh between 36 and 45 pounds. Despite these category designations, a few bikes have already begun to challenge the SL definition, offering full power motors at a competitive weight. And lucky for us, we had a few such bikes in the test to see how their abilities compare to their lesser powered counterparts. With different anatomy comes distinct ride characteristics between full power and SL e-bikes. Full power e-bikes can fly up climbs and are not easily phased on descents due to their weight. The downside is there are a lot more bike to manage on trail, creating a riding experience that's vastly different than a typical mountain bike ride. SLE bikes aim to split the difference, giving up some of their power and range in exchange for easier handling and increased responsiveness to rider input. And now with the introduction of these full power, welterweight bikes, a best of both worlds experience has been targeted, where riders receive unfiltered power without suffering a huge weight penalty. So what bikes did we test? On the docket, we have Specialized's Gen 2 Levo SL, Santa Cruz's Heckler SL, Giant's Trans X Advanced E Plus Elite, Trek's Fuel EXE, Cannondale's newly released Motera SL, RE Bikes' brand new Nebo Peak, and a bike you may have never heard of, Carbon Bikes Powerline SL. In our group of test bikes, we had rear travel ranging from 140 to 160 millimeters, Battery size range from 320 to 601 watt hours. Motor torque range from 50 to 85 newton meters. Retail price range from $8,000 to $12,000. And weights range from 41.6 to 46.8 pounds. All of the bikes tested fall into the e-trail bike category based on travel. However, geometry varied quite a bit between bikes, creating a broad spectrum of strong suits and intended uses. Some bikes favor descending performance or peak motor output, while others look to achieve the lightest weight for increased maneuverability. For consistency, and because we like the smash, we mounted the same Maxxis Askai and DHR2 tire combo with double down casing and max grip compound on each bike. Tannis's latest Fusion tire inserts were also used for extra security, and Feedback Sports tools and stands helped streamline the dizzying number of bike swaps we had to conduct. Since this is not the stock configuration for any of these test bikes, our weights are likely higher than the manufacturer's claimed weights. We broke down performance into seven categories to keep our impressions focused as we switch between bikes. These categories included motor performance, analyzing overall motor feel, usability of modes, and noise. Battery performance, average ride time on one battery when ridden in various modes. The goal was not to maximize battery life, but to provide an estimated average. 
User interface, analyzing the functionality of the assist switch, on-bike display, app features, and system tunability. Frame details, analyzing cable routing, frame protection, and minor details. Value, did the build meet, exceed, or fall below expectations? Where was value provided, and where could it be added? Climbing performance, analyzing pedaling position and suspension efficiency. Sendability, analyzing descending performance in the most demanding sections, focusing on stability, composure, support, and suspension performance. And lastly, fun factor, how easily can the rider influence the bike, focusing on maneuverability, responsiveness, airtime, and speed generation? With such a mixed bag of unique bikes all claiming the SL title, there are a lot of exciting things to break down. We spent the past week logging over 70 miles and 40,000 feet of climbing between the three of us, so if we look or sound a bit haggard, it's because we don't half-ass these tests. So without further ado, starting from heaviest to lightest, let's kick things off with Cannondale's Motera SL. The Motero SL is Cannondale's first dive in the SL EMTB category. Freshly released in February, they took the same approach as Giant and Carbon Bikes, delivering riders full power in a lighter package. The caveat though, they've created a true full-size e-bike, meaning it pairs a 85 newton meter motor with a 601 watt hour battery and has a claimed achievable weight of less than 45 pounds. Cannondale's goal was to give riders the best of both e-worlds, a playful bike that's eager to respond to rider input with uncompromised power and range. Cannondale achieved this by using a custom-tuned Shimano EP801 motor and a custom high-energy density 601 watt-hour battery weighing just 6.8 pounds. For comparison, a Shimano 504 watt-hour battery weighs around 6.3 pounds. So the Matero squeaks out an extra 100 watts for just half a pound. The EP801 motor is also one of the lightest full-power motors on the market, weighing just 5.9 pounds. Unlike most Shimano systems that offer three assist modes, Cannondale has created two trail modes that land between the usual eco and boost modes. The idea here was to give riders a trail mode with the power you'd expect from an SL motor and another with the power you'd expect from the EP801. Of course, modes can be adjusted in Shimano's eTube app and you can now get up to 15 different modes if desired. The Motera also uses Shimano's familiar assist switch, integrated top tube control unit, and a handlebar mounted display. The mixed-wheeled Motera SL lands on the aggressive side of the all-mount category with 150 millimeters of rear-wheel travel paired with a 160 millimeter fork and a rather progressive geometry package. The head tube angle is stretched out to a super slack 62.5 degrees. The C-tube angle sits at 77 degrees. Stack heights are tall across all sizes and the size-specific chainstay lengths are moderately long. This all adds up to a bike that is intended to remain calm and predictable at speeds while maintaining an appropriate pedaling position. There are a few points of adjustability built into the frame, including angle adjust headset cups that change the head angle by 1.2 degrees, and a flip chip in the seat stay that maintains the geometry if you decide to swap from mixed to dual 29 inch wheels. The Motera SL's most unique attribute is hands down its flex pivot stays. Adopted from Cannondale's XC frames, the flex pivot replaces the traditional horse pivot creating a lighter one-piece rear triangle while maintaining the braking performance and playfulness of the design. Cannondale offers three Motera SL builds ranging from $7,000 to $14,000 and all use the same Series 1 carbon frame and E-components. Sizes run from small to XL and each features size-specific kinematics as part of Cannondale's proportional response approach. We tested the SL1 build that retails for $8,750, making the Motera SL the second cheapest bike in the test right after Ari's Nebo Peak, and our size extra large test bike weighed 46.8 pounds, making it the heaviest in the group. Build highlights included a Fox Factory 36 fork and Float X shock, SRAM Code silver brakes, a SRAM XO transmission drivetrain, and DT Swiss XM 1700 wheels. All right, I know we're all pretty excited to ride this bike because it has some pretty unique geometry, the head angle's super slack, and it's truly like the only full-size bike in this test. Um, it was also the heaviest, which I don't think is was a bad thing on the trail as its abilities kind of shined in other places, but let's start by talking about motor performance. The only Shimano system we have, how did you guys get along with the EP801? It was awesome, like coming off of a one of the lower power bikes the first day it was really nice just ripping up the hill for the second second outing that day mm -hmm. and yeah it's a bit loud you know 
like any agree. Shimano motor. <laughs> um, but it rips. It's like just hauling uphill and felt bad. I think Clear was on a lighter bike that day that the motor wasn't was going into like limp mode and <laughs> I didn't realize I'd left him behind and you he left. was putting out quite the effort. I had no <laughs> idea his bike was slow, but we were ripping. So Lear was left behind in the mud. Uh, <laughs> No, that, uh, I mean, I rode the Cannondale today and right, we wanted to, I just wanted to see how fast it was on that last climb and put it in boost and like, just was like later guys. And I think I set the timer at the top and it was like six minutes before you guys showed up roughly with, you know, some weird little stops for both of us. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I mean like six minutes on like, like it's a third of a third of the time cut Mm -hmm. from just going from a lightweight to the full size e-bike, which was huge. I mean, really it's almost a different experience for me. Like I think it's, it's great to have this bike because it really almost is like the separator to the full size e-bikes, you know? Um, But yeah, it's, it's a whole nother beast when it comes to like output, you know, we have like all these sort of climbing performance, all these different things. And it's like, you don't even notice that with how much power this thing is putting out, right? Yeah, like it's it almost was, obsolete. Yeah, yeah, but also it is like when we were on the, you know, when I'm on the track and we're passing people on regular bikes on the trail, I'm, you don't hear it. Like you cruise right by them on the Cannondale, like that Shimano motor. I'm yeah. like <laughs> nervous. Think, Are they going to like, yeah. I got to pass these people with like some courtesy because otherwise I'm the jerk on like, the loud yeah like, ripping up like a multi-use trail you know yeah so it's a yeah it's a different experience i wouldn't even your friends if they're on other traditional sl powered e-bikes they're gonna hate you if you're riding this like it's a different experience totally yeah i would say it was the loudest motor in the group and then exactly to that point i mean it's the same motor that you would find in a traditional full-size e-bike with yeah. a shimano system so it and a way lighter yeah. bike too Mm -hmm. So you're just ripping. Yeah. It was fast. That is a really good point. Like we don't have a, you know, say like a typical full size bike to compare it to as to like, is it more efficient getting up the hill? Because Mm -hmm. it is a few pounds lighter than your typical full size e-bike. But um, I mean, if you've ridden a Shimano bike, it's literally the motor you've ridden before. So it's familiar. It ramps up nicely. I think that motor is very cadence dependent. Like as the more you give, kind of the more it provides. So you're more motivated to spin at a higher cadence. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people, because that motor is so popular, are sort of used to that mentality anyways. So it's familiar in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Um, I was hopping in the app quite a bit because I had my phone connecting to all the bikes. And you can program 15 modes now with Shimano system, which I think is like way excessive and not needed. And I put us at seven assist levels which my experience was that from they still categorize it as you know setting one is eco two through six is trail and then seven is boost and eco is a very defined feeling boost seven is very fast and then all of our modes in between i didn't notice a huge drastic change so i use it in the more traditional setup i don't know if i had it in the seven Mm -hmm. mode you, yeah, you may. You're right. Uh, you're at the first, the first day. day. I just mm-hmm. had the traditional five, and I feel like that's mm-hmm. a more even taper between modes. Mm-hmm. Um, didn't spend much time in eco, but like trail, I feel like what you're saying is kind of what you're used to. Like if you're going to spin at a higher cadence, mm-hmm. it's going to still rip. Um, and then boost is kind of like just reduces the input required, obviously, to get up to that, that max speed. But yeah, the yeah. seven modes, you feel like just kind of blended together more. Totally. Yeah. And <clears throat> I think that anybody can spend enough time in any of the apps for any of the bikes we tested here and achieve the feeling and goals they want out of really any of these motors. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, maybe getting into more of like the, the interface components and the app in particular, I think Shimano's app is maybe a little complex for your first, like right when you buy a bike and you're like, I'm so excited to set it up. I'm gonna jump in the app. And there's just like, too much going on. It's like yeah. overwhelming. Not that you can't understand it eventually, but it, uh, Steep learning curve kind of, yeah, yeah. exactly that. Um, I mean, other than that, like personally, I think the assist switch that Shimano has is one of my favorites. It's really easy to find the buttons, identify mm-hmm. them, an obvious click when you press it. Yeah. There's mm-hmm. no like question if you're changing modes. Uh, the display leaves a little bit to be desired for me. Like, 
it's easy enough to like press it and cycle through stuff, but you still don't get a battery in a percent. Um, I don't know. It's just maybe a little simpler compared to like Trex TQ system or even specializes. That's really simple, but it's like everything you need almost. Even the thing. Yeah. Crazy good display and it's like a ton of menus, but maybe that's not necessary. Mm-hmm. But Shimano is also kind of slow to adopt new things and they kind of work with what they like with any of their products. It's like they mm-hmm. know what works for them. Yep. And they don't really change it until they see like a dress, like a real reason to do a drastic overhaul, I feel like. And it sounds 100%. like it sounds like any adjustments or like more info that you'd want to know is like available in the app. But uh, we're, we weren't able to connect the app to this bike. The app connected, but to view battery percent, I believe your only ability for that is through like a computer, like a, uh, like a to GPS. Get direct percentage. Yeah, because otherwise we're working with five bars, which right. is, yeah, who that, knows what that means? Yeah, that's a bit of a Vague. bit of an oversight. Like uh, maybe if you pair it, did you pair it to your computer if you, or if, your, if you like, could. A, like a watch or something? Yeah. Or, yeah, yeah, like as far as I'm aware, it's like a head unit. So I like a Garmin. That, yeah, that'll whatever. bring it up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But to be fair, like compared to other bikes, like, you know, we had the big debate about like when you get into the exact percentages, all of a sudden the, they start to like the same lap, you know, from the from 100 to 80, let's say, or versus 80 to 60. They seem to go at different rates as you go through that battery. Mm-hmm. You know, as the battery drains lower, it tends to go faster almost. So maybe their strategy there is like to not be too precise because then the user starts to think, well, I can go exactly 4.5 miles and mm-hmm. then they don't put in the effort mm-hmm. on a climb and they only yeah. make it 4.1. You know? Totally. And, and two, with their display, there is a setting where as you toggle between modes, it'll tell you an estimated mileage you have oh, left. That's, cool. that's nice. So, you know, for, cool. for our use, we didn't really need that, but. One thing that's cool on that bike, I think it's unique to that bike, is also you can kind of bypass the display like with the power button. It's mm-hmm. got like a battery mm-hmm. bar and mm-hmm. then a color-coded mode light, which is kind of cool. If you don't want to call it the handlebar, I think you can yep. probably dip to, dip can to the you, display. You can and the button, the display I, I think that. the button all together too, like the toggle switch, you can mm-hmm. just use the, the button cool. on the frame yeah. that's cool. and kind of declutter. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. something I would do for myself, for yeah. sure. What about just talking about general frame aesthetics and features and stuff what stands out about this bike that's noteworthy one that stands out is the headset cable routing and the uh traditional internal routing i think it's pretty cool you have the option but what i noticed was that with the toggle and display that you can ditch even if you don't it's one of the cleanest like executions of it and i think that is a really good use for a good really good reason to put cables through a headset is to just kind of get them more out of your line of sight Mm mm-hmm there yep. is still a toggle. I guess the toggle button still goes along the dropper there, but it looks like you could tuck it into the headset as well and kind of keep it out of your line of sight. Yeah, I didn't actually even notice that those cables were going through the headset until I'm looking at it right now because it's like it leaves no wires. Like, you know, it's right under the screen there. It just goes mm-hmm. right up to yeah. it and back Direct. down. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's the wires. It's not like your brake lines or something that's bigger that's like taking away from your bearing size too yeah. much and things like that. Yeah, and plug it at both ends as well, I think. So. Right. Yeah. Um, the one thing that stood out for me is this might have had the least refined charging port cover. It's just like a little rubber grommet yep. that can be, it feels delicate and it's also hard to push back over the charging port. It takes like a little bit of work to get it to really seal off. Hmm. Some minor details, but yeah, I got know. big feet and my heels kind of poke in when I'm riding and mm-hmm. I kept catching it with my foot while riding and yeah, kind of gave up on trying to keep it closed. Yeah. So that'd be an issue long term, I think. Yep. Yeah. Other than that, it's a, a very unique looking bike. It's we'll get into talking about how it rode and how much I enjoyed this bike, but aesthetically it's actually not really my favorite. It's like a really large front triangle, a large down tube, and then the rear end is pretty slim and, and especially with the flex day, which is like crazy narrow. It's a, uh, it's a unique looking bike for sure. Stands out. I think it looks good. Yeah. The I like, stays. Yeah. I like this. Okay, I, I, I like <laughs> the silhouette of it. I mean, I agree. The down tube is like, it's not that the down tube is so large, it's that the top tube is so thin and flat, so to speak, mm-hmm. that kind of gives it that illusion. But I you know, the lines look really fast. I like the way that like the 
top tube and the seat stay kind of are, are one line and mm-hmm. Yeah, the, it bike just kind of has that like stealth jet kind of fighter look to it, mm-hmm. which I think looks cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think the for me, the flex day is the primary kind of eyesore, and the rest. Yeah, yeah, I agree with what you guys said. It's not an illusion; it <laughs> is what you see. Let's chat value for the Hotera. Um, personally, I think this is one of the better value bikes in our test because the Fizar or the Ari. Nebo Peak we rode, it is the cheapest bike, this is the second cheapest, but for only $750 more, you get access to Cannondale dealers, um, same with Shimano. Shimano has a lot of you know, shops you can go into and get the motor service. And I think that is a very big value to me that maybe is overlooked when buying direct. And then uh, it also is a build kit that is really solid. It didn't, there was nothing that I would change if I were to buy this bike. You got, yeah, I mean, these, that, that, this is the only bike here that had the Kashima like factory. Besides the Levo SL. Right, but at like For a $3, much, yes, more, yeah, yeah. Uh, like two yeah. bike price difference. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, like at looking at the build right now, it's like really leaves like nothing to be desired. Um, I can't, I was trying to read what size chainring it is, but it looks at least bigger than like I think one of the bikes had maybe a thirty two on it, mm-hmm. which seems like ridiculous for an e bike to me. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, yeah, thirty four yeah. is like the bare mint. Like if you ride somewhere steep, you can ride a thirty four, but like thirty six is for how slack that head angle is and how fast they made this bike go. Like, yeah, yeah. big chainring, it's nice. Yeah, I think for value. It- definitely exceeded my expectation i assumed it was just over 10 grand when Mm -hmm. we started um and i think part of that is the aesthetic like i think it looks really nice Mm -hmm. and then the build kits kind of leaves little to be desired unless you're really going for like i want top of the line everything um which i think they offer one above this Mm -hmm. and uh but i mean for me like this is the one i would buy 100 percent um especially at that price that's yeah really good from the price, I would have guessed, I think they knocked 2K off of it by deleting two pivots. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is usually how that math works. Out. Uh, okay, just yeah. making sure. Less frame parts, too. Just... <laughs> you know, bivet, bivet, pivots these days are bearings are awfully expensive. Bearings are very mm-hmm. expensive. <laughs> All right, let's chat about how this thing rode down the trail. Uh, we've been talking about a lot of e-bike motor stuff. So let's start with climbing performance. How did this thing feel just sitting on it pedaling up the hill uh it's really good you gotta think about the way that like the torque rolls on with the full power motor you kind of want to be in a position that is definitely a bit forward just to kind of like have some leverage against the bike and i felt like it was a type of seating position where i felt like i could yeah ride it all day i mean any e-bike i'm sure most people would be like yeah of course you can ride all day but we rode all day for three days and you'd be surprised (laughs) that uh there's some that you'd rather get off (laughs) sooner than others and (laughs) This wasn't one of them. I thought it was, um, yeah, felt felt pretty planted. And I think you mentioned there's like size specific rear triangles, and that really pays off. I think on an e bike when climbing. Yeah, especially when we get in these extra large sizes too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I mean, I didn't get as much time on this bike as other bikes, but like the climbing wasn't even something I like thought about because the motor power was so much. It was just like. Mm-hmm. the easiest thing to get back up the hill on um yeah fair which says a lot yeah. yeah 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 the only thing i noticed is that the with the head tube angle being as slack as it was is that there was a i noticed more front wheel flop in kind of slower yeah. tighter situations but you could change the you know the flip chip or the the headset adjust mm-hmm. pull the head angle in a little bit and probably kind of negate that issue so yeah um, at yeah. lower speeds definitely mm-hmm. there but i think because it's so fast uphill, mm-hmm. I was like, just feels sweet. Like, yeah. It's just like running into stuff. Like, oh, turn this way, turn that way. Let's, uh, don't even slow down. Yeah, yeah, if you ride somewhere that's very tight and technical and twisty and you don't really have the opportunity to open it up, I think that might, not, you know, it might not yeah. be as advantageous in the, that climbing situation. But for the more, you know, if you're a fire road climber, Pat, two track pathways, even stuff that just isn't super tight or technical. It's yeah. like just non issue. Yeah, yeah. non issue. Totally. It's like a bike park, you know, bike without mm-hmm. the 
chairlift kind of thing, you know? I mean, yeah. yeah the chairlift once, is in the bike. It, it is, yes. <laughs> All right, what about going back down the hill, talking about sendability and the competence and suspension design and all that what kind of stood out uh the stability for sure just from the geometry i think like body position was pretty sweet um yeah just felt like you could go as fast as you wanted and run into stuff and i think i probably had the shock set up a little stiffer than you guys did like not as deep in the sag as i should have been um and then just talking about those that tighter terrain, like we did one high speed trail mm-hmm. and then one tighter, more technical trail. And I definitely found myself having to plan way ahead on the technical trail. I think I got a few turns in and I was just like, Whoa, that's not <laughs> not like the first trail at all. It was like <laughs> Yeah. But it wasn't ever really an instance of like the front wheel feels like there's no pressure on it and it's like stepping out on me or anything. It was kind of just like I'm aware of the turning radius and I need to think about that before I point the bike through. But we rode like an incredibly tight trail that was, you know, pretty sketchy in some spots. Had like some down trees that were cut. You had to mm-hmm. kind of zigzag through to low speed. And um, yeah, it just, just kind of have to think ahead on that stuff. And then you get to not think on the high speed stuff more. Yeah, probably really lends itself towards the more bike specific trails. You know, if you're the type that maybe has to ride more of a hiking trail situation with like more switchbacks and things like that, mm-hmm. it's not going to be as happy or find itself near mm-hmm. as home as some of the other bikes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, super planted. Like I was kind of blown away by how smooth some of those like sharper edge, like chattery moments felt like it just really dampened it almost. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if that's like the flex day, mm-hmm. just the suspension in general, maybe some of that could be a little more weight, you know, some of those bikes, um, yeah, that weight in the down tube and in the motor, as opposed to the lighter bikes on the test, yep. like that kind of helps keep your feet from rattling a bit. And like, you know, we're all on flat pedals here, like feeling like my feet were super glued to the pedals on it was like a really confidence inspiring feeling. And, mm-hmm. and, um, you know, I think I checked the bottom bracket height and it was, fairly low it wasn't anything extreme but yeah this bike felt like you were in it you it were feels low you were mm, yeah. yeah it's like a, you know you're skiing in it so to speak like yeah. you can steer with your feet more because it is a slacker head angle mm-hmm. you're not like you know if you're the type of person who's turning around stuff it's not for you but if mm-hmm. you want to like steer with your hips and your feet in the back 100%. wheel yeah. it just well and those like hiking it. trails you mentioned like if you really know where you're going i don't think it's a disadvantage because then you can ride it mm-hmm. steering with the rear wheel and like shovel in the turns kind of more yeah for, and, for and an advance a, a more advanced sure, rider yeah. for sure yeah, yeah. like Absolutely. i would i would say having steep or rough terrain is kind of a must to warrant having a bike with such progressive geo and yeah. capabilities to send at a higher speed mm-hmm. yeah of like, course yeah super yeah. rocky like like tech. You, you need like a, yeah. you need to have trails with a higher average speed mm-hmm. more often than not to yeah reap the benefits of what the bike can do yes um don't bring your downhill skis to the park yeah exactly (laughs) well and you know it's 150 160 travel it's not in the enduro space necessarily Mm -hmm. but to me this was like the most comfortable descending bike in the group it Mm -hmm. reminded me of like a downhill bike almost like pointing into really rough stuff and the body positioning being in the bike and stood up could just not worry as much mm-hmm. like yeah the front wheel's way out in front of you yeah you're like never really thinking mm-hmm. like i could go over the bars like that never no never like, a moment from like that. my shoulders and hips forward it, everything was calm and okay yeah. and then what was happening behind me and like what the bike was doing dancing mm-hmm. i'm like i'm sure it was getting crazy but it didn't really matter because it always stayed calm and predictable and stable it was mm-hmm. great all the able words it checked every single one of them <laughs> all except um, one yeah uh it also was pretty quiet like i i thought this bike had a more hollow sound sort of like the transition relay but it it was silent you know it wasn't too bad yeah rocks hitting it yes i definitely that was one thing i noticed right off the bat i was like whoa it's resonates pretty loud because you know they've thinned those tubes down as much as possible it's a really large volume that's kind of normal for a Mm -hmm. full-size e-bike but i think like because it is so slimmed down it was pretty damn loud yeah 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 i i 
But like component wise, uh, suspension totally, totally silent. Yeah, hundred uh, yeah. percent. Yeah, I think for how sick this bike was on, especially the the rough and rocky trail we rode, mm-hmm. I'm like, I want a 38 on the front and yep. probably a 174. <laughs> like I tried to look yeah. up if they say you can or can't and couldn't find it. So use your best discretion if you decide to do so. But I think that like. It feels like you that matches. With the, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Put the Even run 62. it in the run it in the steeper yeah. head tube angle. Put a bigger fork on it and go find like the gnarly stuff around where you live, and you're gonna have a great time. Uh, since this is an SLE bike test, talking about fun factor maneuverability, I would say that's like not where this bike shines, but that's totally okay because it's obviously not going for that. Like it's it's just less eager to be thrown around compared to the lighter bikes it doesn't mean that you can't be creative you know but like it's in a different way exactly like Like you yes experience bikes like that where it's like it may not be the fun factor of like bouncing offside hits Mm -hmm. but like scrubbing a jump as hard as you want at speed is pretty fun oh my gosh like being able to jump into a rock garden or yeah who doesn't love that right yeah i think the bike just didn't you know what i've written down didn't operate at its peak at slower speeds Mm-hmm. You know, this bike wants to be so elegantly put. So <laughs> it just <laughs> wants to go fast, you yes. know, and yeah. it and I that being said, it, you know, might not be the most ideal bike for someone that's newer to mountain biking or like not riding somewhere super technical or super steep or super fast. You know, um, it, it kind of definitely felt more like the shredders bike, so to speak, or whatever, you know, whatever term totally. you want to call it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's fair. Like it, um, I guess going back to like the fun factor, it's fun in different ways. Mm-hmm. I enjoyed the that split second in my mind. I want to do a different line and just being able to do it and being having trusting the bike. Where on the lighter bikes, I would have that same thought about, oh, I'm gonna like inside this corner, or I'm mm-hmm. gonna pull up off the side hit. Mm-hmm. You can you can apply the fun aspect in different ways in different parts of the trail, and I. Um, you know, yeah, I guess getting to like a, what's the bottom line for me, it is a sick midweight e-bike, like super capable, lots of confidence, the motor and interface with everything is familiar. It's tried and true, but Mm -hmm. it's not, it's not as maneuverable as the other bikes we rode. Um, but that, that happy medium of full power, sick range, and then it's easier to move around if you're comparing it to bikes that are maybe more similar to full-size e-bikes yeah it's more like if you're locked into the full-size category it's about as good as it gets for that type of stuff but for the sl category it's on the outer edge for sure and it's more down to geo than weight at that point i think Mm -hmm. but that's good yeah what do we have have it coming in at 46 pounds 13 ounces with our tire setup and and, yeah yeah. (laughs) which is yeah, I mean, it's consider- a realistic considerably setup. lighter than my personal full-size, you know, 170, 180 e-bike for sure. And felt felt almost there. Like, I wouldn't be, I would love to see a 170, 180 bike of that style mm-hmm. in that, you know, weight mm-hmm. category. Something that you could, yeah, maybe you're not going to get the most range out of it, but like super fun weight for what it has for sure. Giant's Trans X Advance E Plus Elite is more than just a mouthful. It was one of the first e-bikes to offer riders a full power motor in a lightweight package, delivering 85 newton meters of torque at a 400% support ratio while weighing in at just 46.1 pounds. Giant worked hard to give riders an agile e-bike without compromising on power. The secret sauce that allows for this previously unheard of combination is the Energy Pack 400 watt hour battery. Co-developed with Panasonic, the battery features all-new, larger-but-lighter lithium-ion cells. The cells have a higher max discharge capacity, making it possible to deliver 85 newton meters of torque from a battery that is half the size of others. The battery is paired with Yamaha's latest SyncDrive Pro 2 motor, which has the same power as Giant's full-size e-bikes. The refined motor weighs significantly less and has 37 millimeters more ground clearance. Motor power was tuned for a natural, near-instant delivery thanks to Giant's Smart Assist technology. It uses sensors and algorithms to calculate the exact amount of assistance needed at any given moment. There are five assist modes on tap and you can adjust the peak torque, support ratio, and acceleration rate of each mode in Giant's Ride Control app. A simple integrated top two display has lights that indicate the mode and battery life and a wired assist remote toggles between modes. 
The Transax Advance has 140 millimeters of rear wheel travel combined with a 150 millimeter fork. We would define its geometry as modestly progressive. It isn't excessively long or slack, but successfully balances being descent focused enough with a comfortable pedaling position and a manageable wheelbase. There is a flip chip in the rocker link that provides two geometry packages, but we only rode the bike in the low setting. The stock position offers a 65.8 degree head tube angle and a 76 degree seat tube angle, and all sizes roll on mixed wheels to help further liven up the bike. The smaller rear wheel also allowed Giant to achieve a 447 millimeter chainstay length despite having to fit the lower link of their Maestro suspension design around the motor. Giant offers four Trans-X Advance builds with the retail price ranging from $5,700 to $14,000. Of course, prices will vary depending on when you are shopping, so check Giant's website for the most up-to-date pricing. Sizes run from small to extra large, and all builds use the same advanced grade carbon front triangle with internal routing that enters through the headset and frame. All models also feature a carbon rocker link, while the cheapest build is the only one to use an alloy rear triangle. We tested the Elite One build that retails for $10,000, making the Trans-X the second most expensive build, tied in price with Transitions Relay and Trek's Fuel EXE. Build highlights include a Fox 36 Performance Elite Live Valve Fork, a Float X Shock, SRAM Code R Brakes, Giant Carbon Wheels, and a First Gen SRAM GX Axis Drivetrain. Full power meets light-ish, the Trans-X was a unique bike due to its size, component spec, and strong motor power. While it did not lust for the descents as much as Cannondale's Motera SL, its evenly spread abilities provided solid performance throughout the entirety of a ride. Full power meets light-ish e-bike. Uh, the Trans-X was a pretty unique bike due to its size, the component spec, and the power it provides. So, Let's just start breaking down the motor feel, e-components, battery life, all that stuff. Yeah, I think the whole smart assist technology is pretty legit. <clears throat> I never really had an instance where I felt like there was a delay in power delivery. Seemed pretty comparable to a Shimano, but a lot smoother. Like, not so much of a kick into it. It definitely just kind of rolls on nice and builds the same way a Shimano would, but doesn't start as aggressively, I, I felt like. I would agree. That was my experience. I think that's my favorite feeling motor and it's tough because we have lightweight packages and, and full power, but I guess comparing it to the Cannondale, which it's the closest counterpart. Yeah. It's a much more natural feel. Like it's always kind of ready to get up and go when you need it, but it also can just, the power can kind of exist in the background when you're pedaling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think a big thing to notice is like a lot of these bikes behave differently. If you're on a higher cadence or a lower cadence if you're bogging down if you're not like shifting appropriately to mm -hmm. like be in the right space for that motor um and it's a really forgiving system right if you're in too hard of a gear it will help you get out of that whether you know maybe you might have to bump up to a higher powered mode but it has mm -hmm. that like torque power delivery to like get you out of that situation without having to like drop a couple gears and break your chain yeah. on the way like change mm -hmm. the way you pedal and stuff yeah, yeah so you know i think that's sort of a common thing among e-bikes is like balancing when you're shifting versus when you're making power adjustments um and it's forgiving if that makes sense mm -hmm. uh, no, that makes a lot of sense and i think it's cool in the lower two modes it felt like level two from zero felt exactly like an sl mm -hmm. standard e-bike and the upper three um like you said, it's forgiving. I just got consistent torque regardless of your pedal input or gear. It was the same, just at different top out speeds, sort of. Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah, like, yeah, exactly like you're saying. Mode two or level two, or you want to refer to it as, is like the same as the 60 newt meter motors at mm -hmm. full, full boost, full tilt, you know? Right. Yeah, full, full tilt, <laughs> uh, yeah. which is pretty insane and kind of the same as the Cannondale makes it means you need to think about maybe who you're riding with or how you plan to use a bike like this because you don't want to get roped into thinking you're getting an sle bike when the reality is you're getting a full power motor mm -hmm. totally and you know kind of on the motor still talking motor drivetrain ish um the fact it was i think the only bike that came with a 36 tooth front chain ring which i think is like what all e-bikes should have it uh, you know our drivetrains are built around a human power and then when you have that assist it ends you way lower in the smaller end of the cassette mm -hmm. which more wear harsher shifts 
all of that. And I think this bike allowed you to stay like much, well, more in the middle of the cassette, but then it had so much power that you're still back down into the small yeah. end of the cassette. So I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but. that could be where some of the forgiveness comes from too, is you are ending up in a lower gear ratio more regularly where it would be useless on a smaller front chain ring. It opens up that, <clears throat> that kind of part of that, that range of the cassette and mm -hmm. kind of lessens those like, Oh, it's just got really steep and I don't have enough, you know, input to get the bike to go. Right. But even in those instances, yeah, it was, it was pretty forgiving. Yeah. And I like that even though they have five modes, which to me, I prefer like a three mode system. It's just a bit more simple mm -hmm. and straight to the point. I found that there was a nice gap between each mode that actually made it usable. You mm -hmm. know, like you can shama or uh, specialize has their micro tune adjustment which gives mm -hmm. you like 10 increments and you can kind of think of that like you're shifting almost like speeds you would and this has that similar feel which i like yeah. a lot agreed and the light you know i guess this is kind of moving on to other stuff but mm -hmm. still motor yeah related you know the light interface kind of what has two tiers of mm -hmm. lights so it's your battery level and then the mode that you're in um, you're not having to run a screen on the mm -hmm. bars at all, which I really liked. Um, yeah, it was really yeah. well thought out. Mm -hmm. I thought yeah. like the user interface, the toggle switch on the bar, I struggled with a bit because of its shape mm -hmm. and where it's, where it was positioned. I would maybe roll it pretty far back if it was my bike to kind of get underneath it. Yeah. Almost like but right, I, like above your dropper. Kind yeah. Of. Yes. Like in a similar, cause I just found that when I was trying to shift up, I would, kind of miss the button or not hit it at the right angle and it would take a few tries mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. where i think if you could even bypass that or i don't know if you're able to switch between the modes with I think the... you do need to have it okay yeah but that that display is done in a really smart way that's simple and effective yeah yeah i'm i'm usually pro display like i want to have the information at my fingertips but mm. that gives you a little bit more than the fazua system that's just I mean, the Fazoo system gives you like one bar of lights that does give the same information, but I like the distinguished, I'm getting my battery life and then the assist mode I'm in. Mm -hmm. Same as you, Johnny, like I hate this assist switch. I, mm -hmm. Not my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> like it's just, there's no, it's so low profile. There's no tactical, tactile, tactile feel. Tactile, yeah. Tactile. <laughs> there, I just, it's, I'm stabbing with my thumb and I spend a lot of my time climbing, shifting modes, looking at the, the top two yes. to see if something's actually happened. Yeah. And because you, I guess that maybe is the one downside of having five modes is that the jump between them is a little bit less significant. So I would, you know, go to go up in assistance and have to be like, did it actually happen? I don't know for sure. Yeah. Well, in comparison to the seven, you guys set up the Shimano with, yeah. like that's where the Shimano, I felt like the five was a good number. And mm. on this, I felt mm -hmm. like. Five was a good number, but the top three sort of blended together yeah. more. Unless yeah. you were jumping from two to three, yeah. that was a more like prevalent feeling, I guess, or, yeah. or prominent feeling. I, I didn't mind the switch as much as you guys, I think. I agree. It uh, it needs more of a click, more of like a, an indication that you clearly press the mm -hmm. button. But mm -hmm. I really liked how low profile it was. I felt like I could flip my bike upside down and not be breaking something plastic on the bike, which mm -hmm. cannot be said for a lot of V-bikes. Mm -hmm. um, almost all of them, you know? <laughs> it was like one of the most durable. In fact, this is the bike I went full OTV on, <laughs> sadly. <laughs> and uh, yeah, like there was nothing on the bars to like break. Yeah. So that's like a... Yeah, a total cool thing. Plus, yeah. yeah, I'm a yeah. I really like this is the first you know, I guess giant, but also like Yamaha motor system that we've been on, and I think they've kind of done a really good job, kind of working out their bugs and yeah, figuring it out. It's yeah, cool. feels very put together and refined. Not like a rushed thing or off the shelf or whatever you want to call it. Like it's uniquely their own, and they put the time in it into it to have their name attached to it. Mm -hmm. um maybe touching just like a little bit of app stuff i was again using my phone to connect to the bike when we were all riding it and it was really inconsistent like just getting my phone to to connect to the bike was not as streamlined as some of the other systems and once you're in you get all the same functions that you would get from the other systems but uh and then that's your only way to see battery in an actual percent which it's nice that, that it does have that mm -hmm. um but maybe not the most 
streamlined in that sense, which probably most riders are not going to be getting the app as much as we were needing to for this test. Mm -hmm. So it could be a little bit of a wash. Right. But if you're going to have a bike without a screen, putting mm -hmm. some more time into the app is a worthwhile thought for sure. Yeah. Or a head unit to kind of complete yeah. that. Yeah. You know, if you are a pro screen, maybe you just go for something that's like a full bike computer that'll mm -hmm. give you more, more information as well. I need my tiny flat screen on the bar. Where's my LCD? <laughs> they gave us a mount. <laughs> yeah, do we true. do we talk about the bar now or should we wait? Oh, that's, we'll, that's, we can wait. We'll get to the bar when we talk about value of this bike. Uh, so, yeah. Maybe last kind of E-related thing. I thought the charging port cover and the way it like pulls out, rotates, and then when you want to put it back over, it like snaps in place. Mm -hmm. is the best execution of that I've seen. It's right up there with Specializes, I would say. Yeah, it's kind of fail safe. Like exactly. even with dirt on that, it would mm -hmm. find its way closed yeah. to some degree. And and didn't seem fragile at all or like it would break. We all these, gosh, man, we've ridden and tested e-bikes and the number one thing to break is the charge caps, right? <laughs> it's it's so like they break yeah. off all of them. And so. Well, it's cool because it's like a dial. So yeah. So kind of like any rotational force is just going to open it or close it. Mm -hmm. Whereas rotational force on any other cover it's going to rip it off or break it. So exactly. it's a pretty smart way to do it. Yeah, I like yeah. that. You guys want to talk about just kind of overall frame tidiness with this a little elaborate bike we have behind us? There's a lot kind of going on. We can get into just build, spec, and value as mm -hmm. well at the same time because we'll probably naturally go there. Yeah, it seems like integration is their... Integration is course. key. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you got live valve going on. You got headset routed cables going on. You got integrated bar stem going on. And it's like... They're going for an aesthetic that I'm not going for whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, we are still looking for those people that are going for that. Yeah. When that there. comes off, though, and maybe the, I mean, the live valve's not so bad, but when it's just taking that off alone helps tremendously. But you're locked into these kind of wonky spacers and adapters, and it just, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's yeah tidy if you never, if you don't care about adjusting it or you don't know much about bike setup and you just kind of get used to it. Not an issue, but for anyone who's kind of in tune with that stuff, kind of a nightmare. If you have a way that you like a bike to feel, yeah. Forget it. Forget <laughs> it with an integrated bar stem. Is Sorry. Nothing worse than that? There's not for, yeah, not for me. I feel like we have to give credit where credit is due because they at least built in adjustability to their one piece bar and stem. Yeah, that is cool. And, even if we didn't get along with the adjustments that we had on offer, doesn't mean everybody might have that right. experience. My beef is more with the fact that it's a $10,000 bike, but there's places I would there have rather been value put on, like brakes. Right. Um, I don't shifting. need shifting. I don't need carbon wheels. I don't need live ba live valve. I don't need the one piece carbon bar. Mm -hmm. Like those aren't adding to the experience of riding this bike to me. Yeah, and I think. The live valve was unnecessary. I didn't really notice it. I never I noticed think, it. I think a more like sensitive or, I don't know, effective version of live valve. I don't know how they tuned it. But if it's on there, like I want to kind of feel it working mm -hmm. and know where it's working and have the option to adjust it where mm -hmm. I guess this would be classified as performance elite live valve. That seems mm -hmm. to be what it is, which I haven't interacted with i've only ever yeah. used the factory version where you're able to adjust those sensitivity levels and that i think is useful if that's what you're into but mm -hmm. again for 10 grand i would rather see a grip two damper in the fork and a factory or even performance elite shock and fork mm -hmm. ditch the like codar brakes that's a i know that's a three thousand dollar bike spec <laughs> you know we're you, better you know, than that yeah they're such a large company i can understand the kind of old past generation access derailleur and shifting but mm -hmm. um yeah i mean you could the it doesn't feel like a ten thousand dollar bike i agree the build below that is seven thousand dollars so theoretically you could you'd have three grand to play with and you could have money saved over and put in some upgrades to the bike that would be worthwhile from that build um and no. too with like live valve almost to your point with the cannondale where the climbing position and maybe climbing performance is maybe not first in your mind because you're ripping up the hill. Like you mm -hmm. have such a powerful bike. Like this is in that same same class to me where you can just, you don't really 
I don't need extra climbing performance out of live yeah, valve, you my, know? I, yeah, the at least only, personally, I don't. The only discrepancy I see is 76 degree C2 angle. And mm. this is like really splitting hairs, but it's like, <laughs> you know, you think it's one degree slacker. If you use live valve, it would keep the bike from kind of sagging in. Mm. So they're like, well, we'll put you in a more efficient, not effective pedaling position mm -hmm. that lets you ride at a higher speed and use the suspension to sort of hold you there. Whereas a steeper one would allow you to sag and still have some leverage against the bike. Mm -hmm. So I kind of understand the philosophy, but I just, it's, yeah, I don't, it doesn't really, I do. don't buy that they like design that the far. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, like yeah, they, yeah. Cause for sure, seven grand, none of that is there. It sure feels like they just got a good deal on live valve. Yeah. And here we are. Yeah. Yeah. A and while ago, you know, <laughs> To, yeah, going into value in a ten thousand dollar bike, that's probably the worst dropper post lever I've used on a bike in the that since in, dropper that's... posts were invented. <laughs> since since like, the under the seat. Yeah. Lever. I mean before that, since the what was the very first boot the one? Cr the drop one, right? The one underneath your seat? Is that what you're talking about? No, the, the gravity dropper? Gravity dropper. Yeah. <laughs> like, I think the gravity Those dropper. Those things are still running to this Might day, have been though. a better lever yeah. than that, for sure. Um, but yeah, I, All right. we can move on yeah. from the build because th this bike does do a lot of things really good. So, <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, um, I'll start talking about climbing performance, even though I, I don't value it as much how a bike climbs like this because you can rip up a hill so quickly. The rear suspension I thought was exceptional at just taking bumps when you're seated and mm -hmm. being super smooth. Like I was never unsettled in the saddle, easy just to spin circles and mob uphill. Yeah. Never did anything weird no. and it's just an efficient platform. Yeah. You know, no bobbing observes bumps. And then, yeah, as far as motor and all that, like we said, just, really easy to get along with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, you guys were saying you weren't feeling the live valve. I'm pretty sure it was not functioning when I wrote it. I didn't see any lights going on or any change in the behavior of the shocks mm -hmm. at all. But that being said, like same thing, like once I set my sag, it like mm -hmm. didn't feel like there was any Bob, um, you know, we're pedaling uphill at <laughs> Between, I'm like averaging up the hill at like 12 to 16 miles an hour and just like riding straight into rock gardens <laughs> yeah. and it's just sucking it right up, you know? Yeah. So like, yeah, it's the, the small bump, the suspension really surprised me, like worked really, really well. Um, climbed good with, yeah, the, the long sort of front center, like you just, mm -hmm. the front wheel fills on the ground. It doesn't feel like it's going to lift or do anything weird, but. Yeah, I think one thing with live valve, since we are kind of saying how we didn't feel like we needed it or it didn't add value to the bike with at the same time, we're like, maybe we didn't even really use it or whatever. Like the bike didn't need live valve mm, to climb to well, yeah. you know, so right. well, like I couldn't get it to, I messed around with it. I didn't really notice a difference. And I was like, the bike doesn't need it. That's not like that's not what I want to focus on with how this bike performs because also it's only the two most expensive builds you get that with. So a lot of the way people experience this bike isn't with live valve anyways. And part of me while thinking that while climbing, I just had the thought, maybe that's how it's supposed to work. You don't even know it's there. It's that good. Everybody at Fox is just cheering right now. Like, this is exactly <laughs> what we went for Johnny way to crack the code. But part of me wanted to just unplug the wires and be like, what now? Mm -hmm. Look at you now. It's exactly the same. But could be wrong. We didn't yeah. do that. Yeah. But <laughs> All right. Let's, uh, let's chat about, you know, staying on suspension performance. I think we were all impressed with how this bike felt going back down the hill. You know, good. I thought it was active <clears throat> and good support while just, like, tracking the ground incredibly well. So, from, yeah. Yeah. You know. Well, I was going to say, for me, certainly overshadowed by the bar, unfortunately. It just kind of, mm -hmm. I don't know. I know it's effectively a short stem, but I just couldn't help but feel very far over the front of the bike. And I kind of felt on the technical terrain, like it. I was just kind of along for the ride. I didn't feel like I could maneuver the bike that easily. Like mm -hmm. on the mellow or kind of high speed stuff, I got along with it pretty well. But I felt kind of just like stuck over the front of the bike. And would have liked to ride something with some actual back sweep mm -hmm. and just a traditional setup to kind of really ride the bike for what it is. I felt like I would just, yeah, didn't get along with it great. But the suspension did work really well in those instances. And, yeah, 
you know, got it to like the best I could to where it felt like it was a pretty happy place. But unfortunately, yeah, the, the kind of geo threw me off a little. Yeah. And I think like I got to hop on for like half a lap with that bar and stem combo and immediately felt the same thing. Um, felt like I was on a drop bar bike almost like mm-hmm. it's hard to mm-hmm. explain, but there's That's like, exactly the you have like, feeling. you're in your, your palms are being pressed against the handlebars forward and not like downward. Yeah. Um, so I, I really didn't feel like I couldn't, I didn't feel like I could ride that bike without a negative bias, without swapping those out. Mm-hmm. And you had sort of talked about, yeah, how the rear of the bike felt really good. And so I really wanted to feel like I was going to get, give that bike like the best chance it had. And so mm-hmm. putting like our bar and stem on it with like that high lift immediately made the bike feel like super confidence inspiring compared mm-hmm. to what it was like almost a different bike in the way it felt by ditching this bar and stem, which is like kind of <laughs> yeah. sad to say because they like on paper, it's so close, but the feel is so far off. Right. And right. So, that was the, head scratcher right i mean same thing yeah the and sadly didn't quite come with the exact setup to make it super clean with a normal bar and stem but Mm -hmm. we were able to grab some headset spacers and make it work um but once that was done i almost i was like surprised to even know that this bike was a 140 mil bike Mm -hmm. because it felt almost smoother than the 150 160 bikes in the rear Mm -hmm. it felt like immediately almost just felt under forked because it's got a long wheelbase and i was like i want to let this thing go Mm -hmm. like it actually wants to go fast yeah that was surprising to me too i thought it was i mean i guess i didn't read the names i thought it was like the rain Uh equivalent that's how it felt yeah i can't imagine what that bike can do Yeah. yeah but it certainly felt like it was in a category above what it's actually in yeah, super, super great. I I haven't ridden a Giant since that first 29er rain came out, and uh, I was really impressed with how the rear end felt. So I think you're right. I think, like, kind of, you know, when you get into value and other things, it's like the, the bike has a lot of great things going for it. That specific model and build out is maybe not the one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's too many kind of odd little things going on that maybe make it hard to sift through and get to what the bike is best at. Um, which, you know, for me, most of these bikes were a little too big and this bike felt the most too big for me. And I think like you talking just about how like large the front end of the bike is, Mm -hmm. it was like this weird, which isn't like on paper that big, like the reach number is not huge, Mm -mm. but yeah, it does have a, not steep, but I yeah. mean, 65 degree head tube angle mm-hmm. and yeah, maybe, mm-hmm. maybe a slacker head tube angle would kind of bring the bars back and make that roll actually sweep back, not yeah. just be forward and up mm-hmm. and it would maybe all come together. But yeah. yeah. Like I, like for me, it was like, Oh, this bike's way bigger than all the other ones. The rear suspension feels really capable and smooth. And mm-hmm. I start pushing it. The bike's heavier than the other bikes. And immediately I was like, why does it have such a small fork on the front? And like, I just want it to be, it felt like it had more it could provide maybe. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like any of these tests, the maybe somebody who would get this bike, they could tweak things to fit how they would want. Um, mm-hmm. And there is, I would say, a little bit of potential out there for what you could probably get out of this. Um, yeah, you know, it's, we kind of got an interesting spec, but it's, pretty versatile for this like new midweight e-bike category. Yeah, but kind of still on that quote mid e-bike weight category, Mm -hmm. I think we kind of have to dive into battery performance a little bit because as a super powerful bike, I think it almost needs a little more juice to get the longevity that we would like to have out of it. It came very close to killing the battery, but I did go do what you did on the Cannondale with like a full pull high speed lap. Okay. And it dropped off pretty seriously towards the end of the battery life. Maybe if I had started sooner, it wouldn't have been as big of a percentage, but I went through a bar and a half, I think doing that. I went from two to one and then one turns orange when it's past its halfway point. Yeah. And then I was just like, turn it off and just pedal to kind of save it. 
I think you could kind of consider this bike like if you're willing, like if you can have the self control to keep <laughs> it in that one mode one and two out of five as an SLE bike, yeah. at, then you can like maintain the length of rides with your friends on their Fazua's at full power, full power yeah. for their life, but yeah. That's hard to do. Or have and, equally as much discipline to do one, maybe two laps. Yeah. And yeah. be like, I don't need a third or a fourth. Mm-hmm. But, you know. Yeah, I mean, it, it makes it a good bike if you're thinking about using an e-bike for you have a short period of time to get a ride in. Yes. Yeah. After work, whatever you, it is. Yeah. But to think of it as a full power system, mm-hmm. you do have a smaller battery. Um, I mean, looking at our test lap we did, and how much percent we burned on just a lap. All of like the Fazua bikes, we were usually burning like around 15% to 18%. Mm-hmm. All of us burned around, you know, a quarter of the battery on one lap. We were between like 23 huh. to 25%. Yeah, it so it's a like, lot more sense. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, that is riding it in the higher assist modes. It's not having the goal in mind of just how far can we go. But that's why, like you're saying, the, having the foresight to approach it appropriately because well, your battery's not going to last as yeah. long. Yeah, and it could be from like our own fatigue or just riding preferences where it kind of determines that assist. It's not such a black and white like on-off torque curve. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we could have been asking more from the bike than other bikes give yeah. naturally. Yeah, so. yeah, where other bikes you're forced to ride in a maybe more efficient state. Right. Yep. Do you guys want to give a bottom line to summarize the giant Trans X Advanced E Plus Elite? Um, no, I would go down a build spec. Okay. That's about it. I yeah. mean, I think like you said, the suspension works great. It's a great pedaling platform. Descending feels really capable. It's a shame. I wasn't more reared on the bike to really kind of experience the rear suspension. Cause I was only thinking about the fork, um, for the price. I think it's a little over the top, you know, three years ago, this would be, I mean, which maybe it is been out for a while um no no (laughs) oh so i think three years ago this is like a cutting edge worth ten thousand dollar bike but you know at this point in time i i think it's kind of a yeah i I would opt out of a lot of what they've offered Mm -hmm. as part of the build spec and it's primarily build spec yeah great great frame great motor um with the battery combo in this light bike it's not for everyone it's like really like i personally have a hard time seeing anyone getting longer than two hours Mm -hmm. out of it you know Mm -hmm. maybe maybe you could but like yeah two to three hour ride time and that's kind of i mean it um and yeah lots to be sort of desired in the component sense but the suspension is great and um yeah, it's an interesting mix of mix of things going on for sure. Yeah. It's not for everyone. I'm sure that there's someone out there that it would fit really great for. Um, you know, I think if you're used to riding a drop bar bike and you like all this integration and all this tech, mm-hmm. it, you know, it's probably for you, but that's probably not the vital MTB viewer either. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I uh, love the motor. Love the feel of it. I think it can punch a bit above its weight or what you would think it is on paper when it comes to descending climbing it's also great at that you don't need the live valve and all that to make the bike do what it's capable of doing uh but it's not super light by any means like it didn't ride light on the trail to me and that puts it in a unique spot like you're saying it's not a lightweight e-bike it is full power but your range is more compromised than the cannondale so Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, think about what your needs are and if this would fit, you know, how you plan to apply riding like an e-bike. So, yeah, I think, yeah, with the right fork though, and the right build kit, like Mm -hmm. this thing could match the rest of them. There's There's tweaks to go multiple ways. I think to sort of amend my bottom line, um, (laughs) it's a shame because you do have like a super impressive motor Mm -hmm. suspension platform, Mm -hmm. all that overshadowed by kind of just dated technology at this point i hate to say it like live valves super impressive old access access is impressive but it's gotten 
exponentially better since then. Mm -hmm. This was and, the only bike without transmission, so it was like very clear how yeah. much better transmission is. Yeah, and code R brakes on a ten thousand dollar bike is downright offensive um, <laughs> to me. You can like, ask for a formal apology. Yeah. <laughs> no, just kind of like to a buyer that is yeah. knowledgeable, it'd be like, really, mm -hmm. like really giant? You gonna do that? You gonna pull out the center lines and the code R's on me? But uh, you know, that's just. Yeah, that's how I felt. It was get rid of this and put the. This is really light. Uh, <laughs> get rid of that. Yeah, make it heavier and put. Yeah, some more up to date components. Of all the bikes in this year's test sessions, Transitions Relay presented a unique proposition. It might use the same compact yet powerful Fazua motor as a Santa Cruz Heckler SL and RE Bikes Nebo Peak but it's the only bike that encourages riding without assistance if desired. A unique and refreshing approach to the SL category, Transition achieved this duality via a removable 430 watt hour battery. Hidden behind a tool-free removable plastic cover in the down tube, sliding out the battery takes only seconds and drops five pounds from the bike. Our size extra large test bike weighed 45 pounds with the battery installed and 40 pounds with it removed. This made the Relay the third heaviest bike in the test, beating out only the full power Giant Trans X Advanced E Plus and Cannondale's Motera SL. It's still light in the big picture of E-Mountain bikes, but it is on the heavier side within the SL category. And with its battery removed, it was just a pound lighter than the lightest bike in the test, Specialized's Levo SL. The Relay was the longest travel bike in the group with 160 millimeters of travel front and rear. Combining its longer travel amount with the geometry package that blurs a line between All Mountain and Enduro, the Relay does put most of its eggs in the descending performance basket. However, it maintains adequate climbing performance thanks to a steeper C-tube angle and a not-too-slack 64-degree head-tube angle. For riders looking to push the envelope even further descending, Transition offers the Relay in a P&W configuration, which bumps travel up to 170 millimeters with a coil shock and a beefier fork. It also swaps the dual 29 inch wheels for a mixed wheeled setup. Regardless of which build you pick, the frames are the same and each travel amount and wheel configuration are possible with the corresponding shock size and flip chip position. The relay comes in both aluminum or carbon, but both feature the same Fazua E components. The Ride 60 motor is one of the lightest motors on the market and produces 60 newton meters of torque with 450 watts of peak power. Three assist modes, Breeze, River, and Rocket, are selected via Fazua's bar-mounted ring controller and a top tube integrated display consisting of five lights indicates assist mode and battery life. You can also jump into the Ride 60 app to create new riding profiles or adjust individual modes, as well as check your battery life as a percentage instead of bars on the top tube. The relay comes in two alloy and three carbon builds ranging from $6,800 to $12,500 and sizes range from extra small to double XL. Transition has been running sales like many brands lately, so check their website for the most up-to-date pricing. We tested the Carbon GX Access build, which retails for $10,000, tying the relay for second most expensive with Giant's Trans X Advanced E Plus and Trex Fuel EXE. Component highlights of our build include a Fox Performance Elite 36 fork and Float X shock, a SRAM GX transmission drivetrain, code silver brakes, and race face aluminum wheels. We actually just wrapped up a long-term review of the Relay in its PNW configuration only weeks before this test. So having the opportunity to test the lighter build option while comparing its abilities directly against the competition was a great way to gain further insight into where the Relay fits into the SL category. Alrighty, Transitions Relay. The only modular bike in the test, which very unique, kind of one of the first, maybe more mainstream bikes to do so. But this was an e-bike test and so we didn't i was the only one that took the battery out just for a moment to say we did it and ride it as such i've tested their p and w build which is 170 mils of travel front and rear and uh it was exciting for me to kind of compare their build offerings because this is lighter and one of my biggest knocks on the pmw is it was heavy which took away from the actual realistic use of riding the bike with the battery removed and uh this is easier to pedal as a regular bike that doesn't mean I think people will still do it. It's, you know, it's still 40 pounds with the battery pulled out. Most people don't pedal 40 pound bikes anymore. So it's a cool feature and thing to have, but I think the way most people will experience this bike is as an e-bike. And so that's how we're gonna talk about it. And this is the first bike that 
we're going to talk about that had Bazoo's Ride 60 system, uh, one of three. So what'd you guys think? How did it perform? Uh, I really like the Bazoo system. I've never ridden it before. Um, yeah, the, the torque curves pretty consistent. It just kind of at any cadence seemed to kind of just build power in a really nice way. I didn't feel like I had to change the way I rode to match it. Um, with it being kind of the first that we've talked about that is a true kind of lightweight system. You do notice the loss of, uh, of torque when things get steeper, but mm -hmm. again, it's, it's pretty consistent. Like you, you're aware that you're going slower. You're aware that there's less power there. Yeah, I agree. I mean, this is kind of my first time even getting on the SL e-bike. So it's kind of hard to even compare that to anything because coming from one of the more powerful full-size e-bikes like right away i'm like i don't know if this is like what i would even enjoy you know like i felt like it kind of had to be ridden in the purple rocket mode to really feel like it's helping you a ton um but that being said it it helps you and it's mm -hmm. you know yeah it's a great kind of middle of the road system they've done like a pretty good job i guess taking like what specialized and some of these other companies have categorized mm. sl kind as created and and made something that's kind of like off the shelf that other companies can buy and install in different bikes which i think is great because now we kind of have like a little bit of a baseline for different frame designs and things like that um so yeah as far as like the motor performance it seemed to feel pretty natural and pretty good um I don't think it feels like maybe as refined as maybe some of the other brands. Um, I would agree. And that just kind of comes into a lot of things like, you know, the feel is pretty good. They've gotten like the pedal feel is pretty good. But, you know, when it comes to, I guess, the more user interface sides of things, it still seems to like it could use a little sprucing up in a sense. Um, just kind of felt cheap. You know, like when you're looking at these $10,000 bikes, it, the cheaper feeling components are the Fazua component. Like, you know, whether the plastics, the mm -hmm. switches, that kinds of, you know, yeah. the finishes. A little all. bit left to be desired. Like, you know, the ring controller yes. functions, but the feeling is not as definite and crisp as maybe some of the others. It and just feels uh, fragile. Like it could totally. be flimsy. Flimsy mm -hmm. is like a word that a lot of, yeah. Mm -hmm. Same goes for like that little USB charge port, you know, on the <clears> top <throat> with the lights. That's a super cool feature to be able to plug your phone in there. I don't know if I'd ever do it. Maybe like <laughs> before I get a drone shot and I realize my phone's dead and I'm like, let me plug it into my e-bike real quick, you know? Um, I, yeah, I don't know how useful that is. It's a cool feature, but, yeah. um, and that, that thing doesn't rattle, but it, just seems like another thing that could break or another thing that could potentially rattle or just something that's not super solid and integrated into the bike, like the Specialized, mm -hmm. like the Trek, like the Giant, and some of those bikes. Yeah, I think that ring is the biggest downfall of the Pazua system. It's mm -hmm. not always the most, like, sure, I don't know, I don't feel like I get it every time when I'm riding and trying mm -hmm. to hit it. Like, if you're pedaling yes. and changing modes, pretty easy, but, like, in a split second trying to hit it, it seems like it kind of jams up, can rattle, feels cheap. Where I think the Fazua excels is battery usage and noise. Like you mm -hmm. mentioned, you think it's kind of similar to the Levo sound. To me, the Levo is really loud, more similar to kind of between this and a Shimano. Mm -hmm. This, you mentioned maybe it's a higher octave or higher pitch, and mm -hmm. I would agree, but it's one I don't really notice. Mm -hmm. And then on the flip side of that, for battery performance, I was just blown away at how much we could ride and how many steep grades we could go up without, I mean, I don't think I made it past, you know, losing two bars of battery on mm -hmm. the entire ride where the Giant nearly died and the Trek died mm -hmm. and the Levo would be in, you know, down to like 30% and still just feel like I could do that ride two or three times in a row. Yep. Yep. Yeah, there's, you know, we're not electrical engineers, but there's something about what they've combined mm -hmm. with the 430 watt hour battery and a 60 newton meter motor that is like that Goldilocks range mm -hmm. sort of compared to the Trek Levo or sorry, Trek and Specialized that are 
smaller systems that maybe don't give you the power you quite want at all the time, especially in those steeper situations. And then, you know, uh, the more powerful bikes that maybe burn up their batteries a little bit quicker. Um, and then, you know, getting into app usability, their app is really user-friendly. I found, I found like, you know, we had three bikes with this system. I was constantly pulling out my phone to kind of see where you guys are at with battery level. Cause that's the only way to see it in a percent. And the stock modes it comes in are really usable. There's not like a need to go change what they provide you. But if you want to do that, the way they break it down is very easy to understand that what the change you make, how that'll apply to what's going to happen on trail. Uh, like the only little nuance that I didn't really like outside of the ring controller, like you guys are talking about is the lights are really bright yep. on the top two display. And I could not figure out for life of me, if you can actually dim those or not. And I'm sure somebody, if you know, you'll comment below how to do so, but like, that'll just help everyone. Yeah. We appreciate your services, <laughs> yeah. but on like one of the darker days we rode, like I got astigmatism and it was so bright, like in my eyes. I and, didn't notice it until you guys mentioned it. And I'm then sorry. today yeah. it was very much there. Yeah. And then um, the GoPro footage will literally reflect that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, we touched on how, how nice the balance is of that power and range and all of that. Maybe moving on to just frame details and tidiness and everything. Uh, I found this to be one of the louder bikes in the test. Like it just, mm -hmm. with how hollow the down tube is, and especially if you do remove the battery, there just resonates sound. It's a an lot. echo. Very echoey. Like it's like not a chain slap noise. It's like a harmonic noise almost. Yeah, I think more than frame construction, it's the removable interface that rattles. Yes. Like none of the Fazuba bikes have that except for this one. And it, seems to be the source of that because yeah it was super loud yeah yeah um the p and w build i've previously tested i had a lot of issues with the battery cover on the down tube fitting into the bike and then the switch just being able to turn it and like, like make the, sure the cover the dial, like to close yeah it, like yeah. it's not super smooth and i will say this bike we tested for whatever reason was a lot easier but it was not perfect by any yeah. means um maybe kind of continuing on just talking about the frame and, and details like that. Like one of the things I noticed with this bike is that it was pretty stiff. And mm -hmm. because of that, like as I rode the bike and was getting into really rowdy sections, it's like the parts around the frame would start to flex out or just maybe be create a more vague feeling bike, which mm -hmm. is a really unique sensation because this is a very capable bike in a lot of situations, but like the sum of the means don't maybe add up or like, I don't know, it's a very it was interesting. We were like talking about it and it was like trying to get to why we could charge into things, but it wasn't always the most confidence inspiring. Yeah, there. I was really trying to figure out what, what that was, like whether, you know, am I feeling taller in the bottom bracket? Is the head angle feeling steeper? You know, what what is kind of causing that sort of hesitation and i think like you said i think the frame is really stiff and it feels like this platform that makes you want to just like confidently jump into anything but when you do that you don't necessarily have the build kit that supports it being like the shock the fork um maybe the wheels might be a little flexy mm -hmm. you know things like that even um, those carbon Praxis cranks, I think, are a little more flexy than, I don't know, or you're feeling them because the frame is so stiff, so to speak. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I would have really liked to try that PNW build because mm -hmm. I think for what I like to ride, I think that bike might have fallen a lot more towards my Venn diagram of what I like to ride. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I guess... I kind of bottom lined it as I, you know, it just felt like the suspension was maybe a little bit under spec just to fit an SL category. Yeah. But like this bike is really more of like transitions own category that they've created that they want to be mm -hmm. in, which, you know, I think it's almost like this e-bike pedalable free ride bike, but the build didn't reflect that. And it's like, I would almost just lean into this more like aggressive, you know what yeah. maybe not free ride but it's it is the bike park bike that you can pedal up i mean it fits the place it's designed in um 
And I don't think there's like a need to try and like come back to this light SL, like just embrace the fact that it's a free ride bike and let her eat, you know, because that's what it wants to do. Yeah. To go back to frame details, like the stiffness, it's got a straight 1.5 head tube, which is really cool. Yeah. A pretty like sizable, I mean, what would be a BB area, um, down tube, seat tube junction, whatever you want to call it, super stiff rocker link. And I think I experienced what you guys were feeling. And I think it's because you have such a rigid foundation, it's going to transmit that through the components. And if Mm -hmm. they're not, you know, of the same pedigree of stiffness, you're going to feel it more than a frame that would kind of move with those parts. So when you think of a bike that normally has a 36, it would be one that kind of has the same level of compliance as a 36. So it's a really harsh transition between the two, no pun intended. Um, When you have a really stiff frame that seems like it was geared towards the PNW build, um, now spec'd to kind of fit the lightweight category better Mm -hmm. because these parts are firmly in the lightweight category for most builds that we have, most bikes that we have. Mm -hmm. But it's a bike that has the capability to go to 170, I think, front and rear. And I think they're kind of achieving the lightweight feeling out of suspension that, I mean, in my experience, a smaller chamber air shock is more supportive and will almost make the frame feel stiffer in a way. Mm -hmm. But a 36 at a pretty slack head tube angle and a longer travel is going to feel more like a noodle. And when you compare that, or when you combine it with a frame that's really stiff, you it's just going to, you know, kind of over exaggerate that feeling more. And then, yeah, wheels too. I've ridden these on a few bikes and they're, they're one of the more compliant options, I would say. <laughs> Heavy. So you're getting compliance out of like all the components rather than the frame. Yeah. 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 And you know, it's a ten thousand dollar bike. Transition has been running sales on this bike, so you probably can get it cheaper if you <clears throat> jump on it more quickly than not. But you know, it uh, everything you guys are saying there, you know, like the wheels, the suspension. Mm-hmm. There's some areas that I don't feel like the values provided, mm-hmm. but maybe overall the spec is appropriate in like the right places, like good brakes, good cockpit, yeah. dropper. The stock tires were good as well. Um, but the, you know, if you're going for that SL experience, mm-hmm. that's get this gets you closer to it than the PW build I've ridden. Mm-hmm. I still think that this bike is best as that that build kit. The more light, travel, the beefier yeah, for light, like full power almost. I mean, basically I mean, just power, yeah. leaning into how capable this bike is and giving you the component spec to experience. also complement that. Yeah. And, you know. Just because this one's a bit lighter than the one I rode, you know, going down the hill where this bike is focused on, the experience was very similar. And at that point, I'm like, just give me all the parts to really, yeah. you know, ring out the performance when I'm trying to smash. Yeah, down it feels kind of choked up almost because you know what it does in the other configuration. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I think uh, it's cool that they give the option for people to kind of maybe shift what they think they might be into. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, it's a transition. These bikes are sick going downhill. I would say lean yeah. into that. For their debut into the lightweight e-bike category, Santa Cruz aimed to blend stability with a high fun factor to create the Heckler SL. Being early adapters of Fazua's Ride 60 system helped bring that vision to life, allowing Santa Cruz to optimize range and power from a lightweight system while keeping weight to a minimum. The Heckler SL most similarly resembles Santa Cruz's non-assisted Bronson model, rolling on mixed wheels with 150mm of rear-wheel travel and 160mm fork. The mildly aggressive geometry helps keep things comfortable when pushing past what travel numbers alone can provide, and several size-specific dimensions give riders of all sizes a catered fit. A flip chip in the lower link allows for further adaptability to different terrain types. We kept the bike in the low setting for the duration of our test, resulting in a 64 degree head tube angle and a 77.5 degree seat tube angle. The rear center length on our size XL test bike measured 446.8 millimeters, allowing us to easily pop off side hits and change direction. The Heckler SL promotes an upright posture while pedaling and descending, thanks to a relatively conservative top tube length and an appropriately sized head tube length. Santa Cruz wanted to create an EMTB capable of tackling any trail while feeling as natural as possible. To do that, they went with Fazua's Ride 60 system that delivers 60 newton meters of torque and 450 watts of peak power. 
The motor is then paired with a 430 watt hour battery. Compared to Santa Cruz's full power Heckler e-bike with Shimano's EP801 motor and a 720 watt hour battery, the SL model comes in around seven pounds lighter. However, out of the bikes in our test, the Heckler SL landed in the middle of the group at 44.6 pounds, three pounds heavier than the lightest bike in the test, Specializes Levo SL. The Fazua interface has three assist levels, breeze, river, and rocket. Switching between modes is done by swiveling Fazua's bar-mounted ring controller. A top tube integrated display consisting of five lights simultaneously indicates assist mode and battery life. For those wanting to tune the feel of the motor, the Ride60 app allows riders to adjust individual modes or personalize riding profiles, as well as check battery life as a percentage instead of bars on the top tube. Santa Cruz offers the Heckler SL at two carbon levels and five build kit configurations. Prices range from $7,300 to $13,000 and sizes range from small to double XL. The entry level R, S, and GX axis build kits use the most cost-effective C-level carbon, while XO axis reserve and XX axis reserve builds feature CC level carbon. Regardless of the carbon level though, all frames include the same details, including molded frame protection and one of the best chain safe protectors on the market. Our GX axis level test bike is the highest level C build and retails for $9,700, placing the Heckler SL on the cheaper side of our test bikes. The build is highlighted by a RockShox Select Plus level Lyric fork, Super Deluxe shock, Reserve 30 SL aluminum wheels, SRAM code bronze stealth brakes, and a GX transmission drivetrain. Hopping on a Santa Cruz always comes with the expectation that you will receive a premium ride quality. There is a reason they have such a cult following, and the Heckler SL lived up to expectations, as it was a fan favorite amongst the three of us. All right, continuing to move on, we got Santa Cruz's Heckler SL here. It's always nice to get on a Santa Cruz because you kind of, you know what you're getting. Same design mm -hmm. as, you know, across their whole product line. Yet another bike with the Ride 60 system. How do you guys feel like it paired with the Heckler? Uh, similar to the other bikes, it was just really easy to go along with and felt like there was consistent power delivery and yeah, battery performance was awesome, but with the usual drawbacks of kind of the user interface. And, and the usual drawbacks of an SL category e-bike. Like you're not going to rip up climbs that you could otherwise unmake on your normal bike, so to speak, right? Like it's assisting you, but it's mm -hmm. not torquing. Um, yeah, it's relative, right? Within its space. Right, right. You know, I don't think Fazua has sort of, you know, hit the peak of their final finishing on what they could do. You know, it seems like, yeah, a lot of the little plastic bits, the little switch, um, lights being kind of bright, all that stuff like could maybe use a little dialing in. But I do like sort of their format that they've decided on that's just like super simple. We're not going to overcomplicate it. Three buttons on the switch, four or five lights on the screen. Mm -hmm. That's it. Um, I like that. Like I think that's how that's how I want my bike to be, you know, e-bike or yeah, just simple, less stuff going on. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I do enjoy how you have one strip of lights, the color indicates the mode you're in, how many lights are remaining is your battery. It's a clean way to do it, totally. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, I rode this bike further into riding more of the other bikes with the Fazua system on it and kind of found that uh, it maybe wasn't as natural as I thought it was at first. Like I do, and I think the power is really good mm -hmm. for this size motor. Um, but it has an interesting, personally, I thought the feed of power hits really good at first. But if you stay in between when you first start your cadence and you don't start matching the cadence the motor wants you to be in, you end up in this weird like bouncing stage where I felt like power was pulsating a bit. Like you mm. you need to either get past the, the speed you're at pedaling and start matching the motor to be fed that power. Or you would end up in this like weird little no go zone. Um, yeah, I guess it was like flatter terrain sort mm -hmm. of is what you're talking about. Yeah, because like usually it, on you feel it almost top out a little. Yeah, it was like yeah. a like in between like pitches because on really steep stuff you're spinning fast. Mm -hmm. It's feeding you great power, albeit a little bit slower. But on flatter stuff you're also just not really relying on it as much. But 
maybe in more technical terrain where your cadence isn't consistent and you're fluctuating with your input, I didn't always find that the power was right there when I wanted it to be, like comparing it to Trek's TQ motor. That is like full background power when I need it, Mm -hmm. always there, reliable. This, I think, still does require a certain pedaling um, pedaling style to match the motor. Maybe not fully just natural. Yeah, I think like the, the prime example of like a really smooth natural feel is when you almost can't, you don't feel the like jolt in speed. Like, yes. oh, I'm going faster or oh, mm-hmm. I'm going slower, um, which the Trek really... Yeah, nailed and not to get into that bike Mm -hmm. too much, but like when you can feel those lulls in power, Mm -hmm. if you have to do what I call like a little bitch kick or a little quarter crank um, to like get through, you know, if you're worried about catching your pedals on a rock section and you stop pedaling and then you go to pedal again, that first half pedal is not going to have the assist that the second half pedal Mm -hmm. will have. So there's, and you can adjust those lag moments, but it just doesn't feel quite as refined as some of the other motors. Yep, that's the word you, you know, we've said it a few times now, but like refined, it's a great system. It's awesome that it can be taken and put into a bunch of different bikes, but those little things like that maybe leave just a little bit yeah. to be desired, but you can work around it. You know, you can adjust your pedaling habits, get what you need out. Yeah. Of I was going to say it was less apparent to me. Maybe it matches my pedaling style better. Could, I have totally. a varied cadence quite a bit. I'll kind of, gauge my effort on like you know if it's going to be steep i'm going to pedal harder and if it's easy i'm going to pedal a little easier Mm -hmm. and maybe not reach those ends of the the torque curve or power delivery as often um but i felt like the motor pairs with the heckler well like Mm -hmm. it's essentially a bronson and the way that that bike pedals i feel like this is a good good match um and with those little kind of hiccups and the like lulls and whatnot i felt like you know this bike suspension when you go through some bigger dips got some like kind of gets through the travel a little quick and it kind of has a similar characteristic in the way that it pedals to begin with Mm -hmm. um same same battery performance like hardly use any battery for a pretty you know the same couple two three laps we've been doing on every bike i felt Mm -hmm. like pretty impressed with the the battery performance um yeah. yeah, totally. No, I, I think like you're talking about all the climbing and all that, like this bike has a upright yet relaxed pedaling position mm-hmm. that, you know, it makes you just want to go easily grind up a hill and it makes taking on those technical sections pretty carefree. It's easy. You know, mm-hmm. it's, there's not like, you know, this, this is definitely as we're working our way through heaviest to lightest, this is one of those bikes starting to definitely get into like very SL category. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and you know, before we get into talking about how the bike rode on trail and all that, little details that kind of stood out to me about it is I like the fact that the charging port is a little bit further up the down tube, which is easier to get to. It's mm-hmm. a small thing, but a bike like this, you're having to bring it close to an outlet to charge it. Having easy access mm-hmm. is really nice. Uh, really, other than that, I mean, it's, it's a Santa Cruz. Like, if you've owned a Santa Cruz, now you've owned another one. Like it's yeah. not, there's nothing else crazy going on, you know, like it's clean, it's tidy. It's very well thought out. It's quality in a lot of ways. So, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, I haven't ridden a Santa Cruz since, well, I haven't owned a Santa Cruz since probably early 2000, like one or two. And it <laughs> well, was this is exactly the same. a yeah. single pivot <laughs> heckler with a fifth element shock. So, uh, so you're familiar with the heckler. <laughs> so <laughs> the heckler has changed a lot. The heckler was actually my first dual suspension mountain bike. Um, and so it's we kind should of, give you a podcast for this. Didn't you, yeah, it's didn't kind you of, just have a box? It's kind of funny coming back to the like getting on this, and I was actually really blown away by the ride characteristics. Um, mm-hmm. I really enjoyed it. Um, climbing the. Let's get into how it descended. You want to go descending yeah, first? Descend. Yeah. Just, let's just move. Let's talk. About I mean. It. One thing on fit and finish, right. there was like a creaking noise kind of out of the, the drive uh, unit. It seemed. Oh, yeah. We and that was where that. it threw me for a, a loop. I was like, I've owned several Santa Cruises and never had like a creak like that. Mm-hmm. So not sure what that was down to, but it seems more of like 
Oh, I figured some, it out. Oh, yeah? Yeah, we, we did it the first day. I don't know. You might have been setting up another bike. Mm-hmm. I noticed it immediately, like brand new bike pedaling up the road. It sounded horrendous. Yeah, under I, like heavy load. It was I kind thought, of twisting. I thought the motor was loose on the bike, actually. I was like, what is broken on this bike? Mm-hmm. Um, turns out it's just the plastic cap on the bottom of the frame. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think when you're putting a lot of torque on the bottom of the frame, the frame's actually like twisting. Oh, right, And right. that plastic cap yeah, is like just the frame like, and motor. Yeah, the frame and motor are kind of twisting, and that plastic sort of guard cover Mm -hmm. is actually, like, attached to both. both. And so Mm -hmm. there's, like, enough flex going on there that that plastic is I remember that. Now we did kind of look at that. And I'm curious if that's a Santa Cruz design or if it's one of those kind of refinements that Fazua, you know, kind of needs to, to clean up on. Yeah, it seems well, like where we the Fazu meets the like Santa Cruz kind of interface. We yeah, we didn't notice it on other bikes. I think it's really just that cover. I actually took the cover off and went and pedaled it back up the road and didn't notice it at all. It like mm. completely went away. And we kind of joked, we're like, should we just ride it without the cover? Yeah, no, <laughs> uh, no, we should. But I noticed it on trail was a thing. Like mm. under like sections where I'm like, I gotta get on the pedals. Mm-hmm. I was like, there it is again. Mm. And so there's some flexing going yeah. on down there, but funny that we say that because the frame felt so stiff right like right, it was yeah. just super yeah. torsionally uh one piece so to speak yeah. a lot of bikes sometimes the rear triangle and the front triangle can kind of feel like they're bending in between or there's a little mm-hmm. bit of a hinge in the bike it almost created like a like a mental kind of trick like like placebo effect almost like oh because that noise is coming from there i feel like is the frame twisting, you know, make you like kind of question what's going on, but hmm. it's good to know. It's just a kind of aesthetic thing. Yeah. Just the cap, I think, but, but yeah, yeah, I was talking about downhill. I was going to say, yeah, I was blown away by the way it descended. Um, the kind of similar to what Jason mentioned, it was one of the first bikes I got on. So I didn't really notice it right away that some of that small bump chatter is like kind of echoed through the feet a little more than some of the other bikes, I think. But the con like even though it might have a little bit of a rougher feel i felt like the confidence to like smash things was so apparent um and i found myself like some of the bikes i hate to say like lazy riding it's not lazy riding but you're you're just sitting on the bike letting the bike do the work the santa cruz felt like i wanted to jump the biggest sections of trail i could take one big impact slap something and then just do that again um Mm -hmm. so it was yeah super playful in that sense which is kind of surprising because it's got a a decent reach and it's a longer Mm -hmm. bike but and a little heavier and a little heavier and i don't think it rode as heavy as it was i would have guessed that it was one of the lighter bikes by the way it rode that was my guess and the feeling you described of kind of wanting to jump off everything and kind of input the bike as much as possible i got that feeling a lot on the levo sl and i felt like kind of different to what you guys are saying this bike did that and handled the chatter better i felt like it fluttered over the kind of high frequency bumps more easily but i agree with the kind of mid stroke bringing more feedback through your feet where the levo is kind of firmer off the top to begin with and it maybe wouldn't get there as easy i felt like this bike got through the first part of the travel easily and i would have liked if i were to buy this bike, I would want like a low speed and high speed adjust to be able to kind of control that better. Mm-hmm. But for a shock that doesn't have that, we kind of couldn't do much there. But um, I thought it was a very similar ride to the Levo SL in terms of like the kind of play factor and fun factor. Yep. But I thought it did that and the kind of aggressive like smashing better. Yeah. So. Yeah, I I interpreted that definitely playful but Mm -hmm. that like smashing feeling as i could ride it way more deliberately Mm -hmm. and very like i could just put more energy through the bike Mm -hmm. and not have to worry about it reacting in a like crazy way you know like it wasn't gonna do anything nuts the downside of that to me is that it's not the most comfortable bike. Like it doesn't mean it's harsh or anything like that. It just means that like it wants to be ridden really fast. Like as I was mm-hmm. riding it, all I could think of was Jackson Goldstone. Like the way he <laughs> rides a bike where it's poppy, it's airy, it's very like light on your feet. Yeah. And when you are your wheels are on the ground, you are like really picking and choosing that for a reason. Like it's a very responsive bike, mm-hmm. which makes it lively. It matches like the SL category really well to me. 
if I just wanted to go cruise trails and, and, and ride it like a more casual pace, I think it would beat me up a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So it, that was, that was like my kind of like yin yang with this bike where it was really good at certain things. And if I was in a certain headspace mm -hmm. and then at other times, like as we'll get to, when we talk about the specialize, that was like the kind of difference with that bike that was very similar. It's funny. Cause yeah, my experience is almost like contrast those mm -hmm. to where like that's the Levo, like the way you described that. Mm -hmm that's a bike that is kind of, yeah, like I need to ride it more intentionally. This was the bike where I felt like I could kind of hang out more, mm -hmm. but it is interesting because yeah. they're very similar bikes in like a lot mm -hmm. of ways. Um, yeah. I think a lot it's of that two different ways of doing it. Yeah. yeah, totally. I think a lot of that can come down to if you know your preferences with like suspension design and mm -hmm. stuff like that and how you even just weight the bike, like mm -hmm. between kind of all of us, like you're definitely more forward and we're maybe a little more rearward. And yeah. so that, you know, just taking note that it can play into what you for, might feel with the bike and all sure. that. Yeah. Um, do you guys want to, let's do a bottom line on the Heckler SL. Where's this thing land? Oof. It might be my favorite bike. Oh, honestly, no. it's hard to, it's hard to say. I think there were, there were three that were all really up there. Um, I would have liked to have gotten more time on it. Um, but like you said, I, I think I'm someone who likes to put a lot of force into my bike, a lot of rider input. You know, I know I heard you guys a couple times say like, you know, yeah, it's high speed, but we didn't really have like too big of hits. I felt plenty of big hits hucking flat <laughs> out there. So yeah, I don't know what you guys are at now. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just, uh, yeah. Like I like to, I like to be in the air as long as I can. And I sometimes give, very little regard to uh, landings. <laughs> Sick. Yeah. So I felt like this bike felt super confident in that. Like I felt very safe in that sense because sometimes I'll put too much rider input for the speed I'm going mm -hmm. and can end up negatively, um, mm -hmm. as sh especially on heavier bikes, e-bikes even more so. So having the ability to push really hard into something and not feel like I'm going to kind of ricochet out in a weird direction um, made it feel really, really good. And also like, you know, I, yeah, I don't know. I think like it felt kind of like it had more travel than it does yeah. in a way, um, mm -hmm. which yeah, says a lot. Yeah. I think for me, it, it was my favorite bike that we rode. It was, Kind of the best of both worlds like i said the levo was really similar and really mm -hmm. close um for the same reason that i too like to kind of find those like ways to to jump off whatever where it makes sense maybe not as often but i do ride with like the kind of pump track or skate park mindset of like just trying to like find speed everywhere mm -hmm. and then with that speed be like oh now i can like hit this jump to here and this to here and i felt like this opened up a lot of those options where the levo maybe opened up more this opened up almost as many, but then when you get on more aggressive terrain and high speed chatter, even higher like velocity bumps, it just seemed to to do that. Yeah, slightly better. Mm -hmm. I like the motor more. I like the way it used power more. Um, yeah, really all around, I thought it just kind of edged out the Levo for me as my favorite. Nice tall head tube for us big guys. Reputable <laughs> head tube length. <laughs> Plenty of spacers. Thank you, Santa Cruz. I like it. Yeah. yeah. No, I think you guys sum that up pretty well. I fall more in the in in line with what Lear's saying, but it uh yeah, great mm. package. It's got it it can be ridden super aggressively and also be a ton of fun, which I think is perfect for this SL category. Mm-hmm. Founded in 2020, Carbon Bikes is a small company out of Massachusetts whose mission is to create unique and exclusive bikes around proven components. The Powerline SL is their first lightweight model aimed at offering full power performance in a sub 43 pound package via a 75 Newton meter Bafang motor and a 410 watt hour battery. So how is this all possible? And what even is a Carbon? We asked the same questions and were eager to see what this blinged out mystery bike was all about. Carbon's e-bike lineup is a testament to their unique approach of building bikes exclusively around Bafang motors. While Bafang is more prevalent within the budget-friendly commuter category of e-bikes, their frame-mounted drive units are rarely seen in the EMTB world but boast some promising numbers. 
With the power line SL, Carbon wanted to come as close to full power performance as possible while being as far from full weight as they could get. They achieved this with Bifang's M820 motor that weighs just a mere 5.1 pounds but pumps out 75 Nm of torque with 250 watts of peak power. Pair that with a 410 watt hour battery that weighs just 5.7 pounds and Bifang has developed a solid power to weight ratio. Looking at the user interface of the Bifang system, the full color screen provides the most vivid picture quality of any display we've used. Displayed stats include battery percentage, assist level, speed, and a tripometer. Switching between the five assist levels is done with Bifang's ergonomic bar mounted remote. Aside from navigating through the ride modes, there is a plethora of menus within the system, allowing for a unique level of personalization in mid-ride data. With how much information is available on the bike itself, app integration is less necessary. The Bifango app acts more like a standard cycling computer that can display navigation and data in addition to the information already shown on the bar-mounted display. The dual 29-inch Powerline SL lands squarely in the middle of the all-mountain category with 150 millimeters of horse-link-driven rear-wheel travel paired with a 160 millimeter fork. The 64-degree head tube angle helps maintain consistent handling over a wide variety of terrain, while a lengthy 457mm chainstay keeps both wheels planted. A 77-degree C-tube angle creates an efficient pedaling position and places rider weight firmly into the seat. The Powerline SL was the only size large bike in the test, with all other bikes being XL. This meant that the 1,267mm wheelbase and 474mm reach were the shortest in the group. Carbon offers the Powerline SL in three build kits in three sizes. Builds start at $7,350 and top out at $9,700 for the XO Axis build that we tested. Frame construction consists of high modulus carbon fiber front and rear triangles with an aluminum rocker and a custom paint finish with holographic decals. Our build kit was highlighted by a SRAM XO transmission drivetrain, RockShox Ultimate Level Suspension, Magura MT7 brakes, and Carbon's own carbon fiber handlebar and wheels. The Powerline SL was the fourth lightest bike in the test at 43.56 pounds. It is worth noting that the images on Carbon's website do not reflect the actual build specs, so be sure to read the descriptions closely when shopping. The Powerline SL was hands down the wild card of this test sessions due to its unfamiliarity with the three of us. However, with a tried and true suspension layout and quality components, it proved to be an easy bike to hop on and feel comfortable. What took the most time to adjust to was learning the ins and outs of the Bifang system. The outlier in the group, the bike that we all did not know much about, you know, before we showed up for this test, but uh, <clears throat> the car was surprising in some aspects and maybe a bit average in others. So let's start with the Bifang motor system. That was probably the most interesting aspect of this bike as it's the only one that I think it's definitely the time, only time we've ridden it and the only bike in the test that had it. What stood yeah. out about it to you guys? Biggest unknown as far as motors for sure, um, along with the bike as a whole. But it surprised me kind of in the way that it works. It's almost a contradictory approach to, or not contradictory, but just kind of a contrasting approach to the other bikes where they went for really high torque with not a lot of max output wattage, I think. Mm -hmm. yep. um, and the way you ride it is very different from the way that you would, I think it's a, it's kind of an unnatural way to pedal. Like if you've ridden trail bikes a lot and you're trying to get something close to that, this maybe isn't it. It's more if you want to experience mountain biking, having never been mountain biking and you want to do it for the benefit of having an e-bike. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it just felt like it wanted to be lugged in a high gear, mm -hmm. and it was honestly awesome. Like, <laughs> so, well. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, I would describe it as it feels like it has less power than the seventy-five newton meters that it is listed at. It felt like it was more similar to the sixty newton meter Fazua system we rode, mm -hmm. and that power was very low end torque provided. Mm -hmm. You know, once where a lot of these bikes feed in power and as you increase your input it's sort of met and exceeded a bit this you had to stay at a lower input because if you surpass that kind of 250 watts max power output it had 
it would just start to kind of fall flat. There was like no. a, as opposed to an exponential growth in assistance, it just more ramped up and then fell off. Mm-hmm. Lot, lots of moments that feel like if you've ridden an e-bike and you know that feeling, especially on a full-size e-bike, when you hit that 20 mile an hour max speed and the motor quits helping you, um, that you feel that when you kind of out put more than the bike outputs yeah. right yeah. so like yeah I w- it was very like you said um counterintuitive for me like i've been sort of educated to ride e-bikes at a higher cadence treat it more like a spin bike um mm-hmm. and <laughs> every time i like i was struggling with this bike because every time i would feel a loss in power i would just downshift and be like, okay, I'm just gonna get into a more spinny year, and I just felt like I'd get more tired. I was like, what is happening? Yeah, <laughs> so you're going like, the wrong way. It was no. working, and yeah, apparently I didn't experiment enough because yeah. I had this preconceived notion that yeah. like with an e-bike you, <laughs> you could go spin faster, more, you pedal harder. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then um, and then that was magnified more. I don't think we were we were having some charging issues with the bike upside down, maybe the but the mm-hmm. on button got pressed while it was charging. So it was kind yeah. of like yeah. really so user error. I more. think I think there could have been that, but regardless, there was like the very first day we plugged in all the bikes and mm-hmm. like an hour and a half later and we for and whatever reason, I don't know if that's a user error of you have to really plug in the charger mm-hmm. to like a hundred and one percent. There's there is regardless of what the point is we plugged in seven e-bikes and they all charged and this thing took two different tries because we would go to ride it and it was dead so yeah user error whatever you want to call it that means that it requires more focus to make sure you get it charged. yeah i think the upside down thing hit the power button that was mm-hmm. our fault but just looking at the charging cable alone mm-hmm. it's like half the size of the other ones so it's just not mm-hmm. you know yeah. in the able the, to charge as fast the port itself is smaller cheaper looking i have nothing to back that up mm-hmm. it's just comparing it to kind of what all the other bikes are using it's yeah, very that, that simple input. looking yeah that input is just like yes. a smaller gauge wire yeah and yeah. uh yeah it um but i think you know on the trail when you ride it the way it likes to be ridden which is maybe like you're saying johnny that entry new to e-biking rider who maybe naturally is going to be a gear or two taller than we might mm-hmm. choose to ride an e-bike it feeds power fine. Like it, uh, in my mind, this bike was going to be more similar to the Cannondale and Giant on paper because of the just the newton meters of torque it can provide, mm-hmm. and it was definitely not like that. Like we did a yeah. we did a lap together, and like when you were on the transition, and yeah. we were riding at the exact same pace and a similar output. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, and yeah. So going a little bit back to the battery thing, the charge situation. My first time on it. Um, you know, started riding, wasn't quite at a full charge, maybe like 80 something percent. I don't really recall. Um, two laps later, I'm down into the 20% range and that's when the limp mode is engaged. 19% as we 19%. And that's it. That was at the bottom of the hill, had to work up a steep hill to get back. And, um, <laughs> yeah. I was feeling like I was putting in every bit as much effort as my standard enduro bike without a motor, without a battery, yeah. which kind of has me, it has me in the mindset of like, well, why? Yeah. Like, why, why not do that at 0%? Or just like, like yeah. why, like when I'm on a bike, yeah. When I'm riding a bike and I'm like, well, yeah, if, if I'm putting in as much effort on a bike with a motor with this that I paid for, why am I even on this? You know, get me, just put me back yeah. on the acoustic bike. Yeah. It's more to worry about. It so, is kind of the, funny how you reach that in limp mode and you reach it when you top out the max watt output. Like it's the same feeling of like, there's yes. a lot of drag. It comes on pretty, mm-hmm. you know, prevalent. It's pretty, pretty apparent when it happens. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, but, and definitely yeah. the battery life on this was more on the scale of the giant. Um, just from looking at kind of our test loop we did, and how much percent battery life we were using, you know, it was higher than Fazua, TQ, and Specialized's motor. So it, you know, you're going to get a shorter range out of this system than you maybe would expect. Yeah, user interface though. Yeah, surprisingly yeah, like good. 
the screen. A lot of information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome, awesome display. It's like a little tiny TV screen. Mm-hmm. It's great. You turn yeah. it on, it's like colors mm-hmm. and graphics. Put YouTube videos on yeah. there. Get me stoked. You hey, know, it's got a you USB-C C port. Yeah. Sky's There's, the limit. It is. Uh, <laughs> you have so much data at your fingertips that you can cycle through. It's like the app. In the, yeah, it negates It literally, app. yeah, it very, yeah. You, totally. It very much so is the app on the display um which is cool and it's mm-hmm. sized the like similarly to the shimano maybe a Very little similar. bigger yeah and the yeah the mounting point i like i like that and i like the control the little control lever mm-hmm. it's got a lot of control a lot of uh different buttons different controls so to speak and they're in a switch in a small format with mm-hmm. like a nice click yep it's they, very uh it's very bosch looking and feeling yeah it's a similar shape You've got like, you know, up and down for modes plus a middle button that cycles displays and turns it on and off. Yeah. But it's, you get the nice click similar to Shimano and, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it is. Cool. I think it's cool because like Bafang does a lot of things for OE manufacturers to what mm-hmm. they want. And I think it's cool to see them kind of do what they've learned and what they want. And yeah, obviously they have a ton of experience and it looks like they have it pretty well figured out. Yeah, Totally. What about moving on to this super fancy looking frame behind well, us? Well, the first thing I was going to say, like frame detail wise, is the headset cable routing again yep. for the purpose of, you know, I'm not crazy about the brakes and shifting having to go through it. But for the e bike components, mm-hmm. super clean. Yeah, it's a great execution of that. It's already a cable that's right there. Just run it straight down through. Yep. Um, other than that, I mean, it's a fairly simple or tried and true design uh, for a mountain bike there's Four not bar. yes there's not a whole Four lot horsing. of craziness going on there's no geometry adjustments you you get what you buy and we were you know this is the only bike in this test that is a large all the other bikes are xl that's just due to the sizing they offer so mm-hmm. uh kind of another detail you know you're you're getting what you purchase with this one it's pretty uh, straight to the point. Um, maybe moving on from that, let's chat about the value of this bike. Uh, it's ten grand, and I would say that that's uh, overpriced for what you get. Like, mm-hmm. there's you can always change components on a bike, and not that you're not getting good components with this, but I think some things for me is like the longer stem, maybe the more simple shock, the lower bars, like. All of those things don't really add to the bike by any means. It short dropper. Short dropper. And I don't think um, changing them would make the bike ride better for sure. But from like a value standpoint, it's like I'm not really sure where I would change things to like cut cost. I just think it's maybe too priced in general. Yeah, to me, so it's, it to me it seems like um, the spec of it is someone like a little more obsessed with like components on paper than actual functionality almost like it kind of has these like bougie sort of spec image but those things don't necessarily like pan out to like good riding characteristics Mm -hmm. and Um, i think oh sorry yeah no i mean yeah it's it's like a beautiful bike uh to look at and it's Mm -hmm. you know but actual rideability of some of those components i might change up Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the comp- the uh, component spec doesn't really add to the ride experience of the bike. It's mm-hmm. a very different ride experience than bikes that would benefit from having those components on it, in my opinion. Like I said, it's kind of your introduction to mountain bike feeling bike, not just from like a suspension standpoint or anything, but the motor power delivery as mm-hmm. well. Like lugging in a higher gear is kind of a great way to burn through your battery and, you know, wear components faster. And the fact that that's the way the motor kind of prefers to deliver power mm-hmm. kind of just leads to where kind of going for it on it. Like doesn't seem like four piston McGurr brakes and ultimate level suspension are maybe going to like benefit you in that instance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Benefit the user who, this probably lends itself yeah. towards. Yeah, and on the opposite end, like when you go to the lower send spec, that gets you like Marzocchi fork and Dior, I think, drivetrain stuff. Mm-hmm. You're still at like seventy seven hundred dollars, seventy eight, and that's just in my mind, the value's not there. Yeah, the value's just not there. Yeah, um, you're paying for the paint job. Pretty much. Yeah. 
It's a bitch and paint job though. <laughs> it's got so some. You can't really argue it. The yeah. the detail, the the it, logos are clean too. It like looks the components. It looks mm-hmm. fancy yeah. for sure. Yeah. It's shiny. It you know kind of looks like. Uh, and something somebody might want to steal off the back of your car, <laughs> which might not be. We put to the test. We're in Oakland, California. Yeah, right. You know? True. Uh, but we had a lock. The biggest letdown for me with that spec build is the cranks. Um, I just, I am, I bend a lot of cranks, and I know that that type of like solid, Alloy. punched out, forged crank oh. is just like asking to be slammed against a rock and bent and if you're gonna put that much effort into like all these other components put like some strong cranks on there um but yeah that's all that's about all i have to say about that let's move on to uh how this thing rode on trail is there anything climbing wise you guys want to touch on we've touched a lot on the thing yeah it, kind of touch on it, the climbing. Uh, yeah. Being that it is the shortest bike in our category, slightly longer stem, to me it felt really, it just wanted to be in like these tight technical kind of mm. flat sections, maybe yeah. some switchbacks, things like that. Mm-hmm. It did, yeah. A bit more cramped, not in like a bad way, just in comparison to the other bikes to me climbing. Mm-hmm. I, was yeah. little, I was just more forward. I think if you live somewhere, if you're, if you're common riding, area is somewhere that's very like tight maybe rocky flat not a lot of you know definitely not the fire road up downhill trail down Mm kind of bike Mm -hmm. it's more like i live in utah and i just kind of ride like technical flat trails that require an e-bike because i have sand because i have rocks Mm -hmm. to get over slick rock to go up that's a great i think it could it could be really at home in that sort of scenario um those areas too are lower speed in general so steeper head angle all those things benefit well, and, it there. And, and the like, load lugging, work and yeah, all that. lugging the bike, like yeah. that's gonna be awesome right. for that stuff. So what about like how fun was the bike to go down the hill on? I Crickets. Yeah, I struggled to get along with it honestly. Like mm-hmm. it's got a very kind of just standard, straightforward feeling. And I didn't really look at geo numbers before riding it and didn't realize how much smaller it was than kind of what I would normally ride. So I think mm-hmm. I struggle with that. The longer stem was the kind of alleviate some of that but it kind of just for me made it a little worse um i think yeah a shorter stem would maybe make it a little more comfortable but yeah there there was it's a, a few component issues yeah so like like struggle with the brakes kind of wandering bite point unfortunately and uh didn't really get a good feel for it mm-hmm. yeah and i yeah i don't want to it's <laughs> Bikes are so good nowadays. It the suspension worked great. It's not by any means like bad, mm-hmm. you know, but it just and it, I didn't even notice. Yeah, like I hopped on it. It felt it felt like the rear end was working great. You know, I didn't feel like anything stood out as like this is sketchy or this doesn't feel good, but when you combine slightly shorter, slightly taller, slightly steeper, all these sort of factors coming together, it's just like they all add on to where it's like maybe this isn't the bike for us. Um, but that's mm-hmm. not to say it's like not a good bike for someone else. But yeah, like going fast, downhill, the rough stuff. Um, I found that the rear end ate it up. It was not that the suspension was holding it back. It's more that like the geo and some of those things were holding it back. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. I It was a bike that I was able... It fit me better than you guys, mm-hmm. uh, but it still felt a little small, even on a large, which is generally what I ride, and similar experience. Suspension was fine. Nothing crazy exceptional, nothing bad anyway. Just kind of middle of the road, and middle of the road in a lot of ways. Like It, it was easy to get on and ride at like that 70% effort mm-hmm. and have fun. I thought that it rode as light as kind of the scales showed. Like it was a bike that maybe because it was a little bit more compact, but just the whole package, I was able to like throw it around and mm-hmm. it, it wanted to be kind of that snappy, playful mm-hmm. ride in a lot of aspects and got a little overwhelmed with like harsh squarage bumps, but it still settled nicely when it got rough. Um, yeah. yeah, it was, it's an interesting bike because it's, it's fairly light. It rides pretty light for an e-bike. It's pretty active. It was exciting for me to ride on descents. I could I could influence the way it rode. The motor was way different in how you had to treat it to get performance out of it than all the other bikes. And like we've mentioned, I don't think that matched the way we like to ride e-bikes. 
but that mm-hmm. doesn't mean that it doesn't suit somebody else. Yeah, and I think what you're saying about the like influencing the bike and jumping off stuff, like we're able to tie into those kind of attributes of the bike. Like yep. we can kind of pick from our skill set, like, oh, well, it'll probably do this, this, and this well. But I think it's really well suited for someone who would maybe be quick to buy an e-bike into their like mountain bike journey, so to speak, of like, okay, I just want to get on something. I think it looks cool their skill set maybe isn't as developed and it's mm-hmm. going to get them there, you know, through trial and error. Like it's going to be kind of easily maneuverable, easily influenced. And if they get sketchy in a rock garden, they'll be like, huh, I wonder what that is. And they might learn a bit about like why bikes that have more aggressive angles are the way they are. But on the same hand, they might not benefit from those bikes with super aggressive angles if their skill set isn't there. So it kind of provides them a foundation that's like, I don't really know how to like pedal up a hill. I just want to kind of like get up there. Mm -hmm. Thought e-bikes were supposed to just carry me up and it does that. And they might want to navigate something they've never ridden. And it's like, okay, well it's really maneuverable and it does that. And you know, as the speed builds, they'll kind of like see the value in going to something more aggressive or more expensive. Yep. Trex Fuel EXE is part of the SL e-bike club that strives to strike the lowest bottom line when it comes to weight by utilizing a smaller battery and motor. Like Specialized's Levo SL or Orbea's Rise, the Fuel EXE aims to give riders enough juice to get up climbs with moderate input, matched with a riding experience that mirrors a regular mountain bike ride. And it manages to achieve this in a frame design that nearly hides the fact it's an e-bike. The Fuel EXE is designed off of Trek's Fuel EX, the Ride Everything trail bike. The EXE shares many aesthetic and design similarities with the non-assisted fuel and features only slightly more reserved geometry. The head angle is a tad steeper, sitting at 64.8 degrees. The chain stay length is 5 millimeters shorter, coming in at 440 millimeters. And reach numbers are spacious across all sizes. Both bikes also feature a minnow link geo adjustment in the seat stay that adjusts the bottom bracket and head tube angle, but the EXE lacks the leverage rate adjustment found on the regular fuel. Travel amounts are the same between both bikes, with 140 millimeters of rear-wheel travel and 150 millimeter fork. And of course, Trek's now iconic active braking pivot suspension design is employed to separate braking and suspension forces. At the heart of the Fuel EXE is TQ's HRP50 motor. Definitely a less prominent E system in the SL space, it provides 50 newton meters of torque with 300 watts of power. A silent operator that takes up minimal space and only weighs 4 pounds, it's combined with a sleek 360 watt hour battery. This ties the Fuel EXE for last place when it comes to motor torque with Specialized's Levo SL and second to last place in battery size just ahead of the Levo's 320 watt hour battery. However, unlike the Levo SL, the battery is removable without dropping the motor. All you have to do is remove two screws and slide the battery out of an opening in the down tube. So, like Transitions Relay, you could theoretically remove the battery and ride the Fuel EXE as a regular mountain bike. The TQ system features one of the cleanest integrated top tube displays that offers four preset screens to display assist level, range, speed, rider and motor watts, and battery level in a percent. A wired assist remote neatly tucks between other controls, and Trex app gives you access to individual mode tuning, the ability to log rides, and recommended suspension settings based on your build. Trek offers a ton of EXE builds in both aluminum and carbon, ranging from $5,500 to $14,000. Sizes range from small to extra large, and all builds come with the same motor, battery, and 29-inch wheels. We tested the 9.8 GX Axis build that retails for $10,000, and our size extra large test bike weighed 43.12 pounds. This made the Fuel EXE the third lightest and second most expensive bike in the test. Build highlights include a RockShox Lyric Select Plus fork with a Super Deluxe Select Plus shock, SRAM Code Bronze Brakes, a SRAM GX Transmission Drivetrain, Bontrager Line Elite 30 carbon wheels, and a Bontrager One Piece carbon handlebar. With a broader range of abilities than some of the other bikes in the test, the Fuel EXE stood out as the go-to SL trail bike when we set out on day one. However, upon learning that it wasn't the lightest bike, in fact, it was a pound and a half heavier than the lightest bike, the Levo SL, we took another look at where and how the Fuel EXE fits into the SL equation. All right, moving on. We have Trex Fuel EXE, which I think we'd all agree sits next to Specialized's Levo SL, just when it comes to describing kind of what this SL e-bike category is. But surprisingly, the build we tested wasn't the lightest, and 
its abilities were more broad than maybe some other bikes we tested. Um, let's start with E component performance again. Only bike with the TQ motor. motor. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe how did it compare to the Zua's Ride 60 and Specialized motors? I feel like it was easily the most natural feeling motor. Um, the transition from like motor to kind of your own effort. It's pretty seamless. Um, it Quiet. Felt, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dead Sleek. silent. I yeah. mean, it's svelte. Yes. <laughs> All the words that mean you can't really tell it's an e-bike. Yeah. Nimble. Nimble. <laughs> yeah, it's all of those. I mean, the uh, I hopped in the app when we first got the bike, and interestingly enough, their most powerful mode is not turned up all the way, which is kind of a weird one. But once we had the settings kind of in their, you know, thirds, they have three modes, so you're mm -hmm. kind of getting that broad range of usability. Totally agree. Like, this is one of those systems that's just in the background, and you ride your bike like you would a mountain bike but the power is always there and it's quiet. So yeah. like, it's a great philosophy for like an SLE bike. Yeah. And, and I think that it's one of the better systems out there too, just from the top tube screen display is, I think it's my favorite. It's, it's just so clean and simple. Yeah. Their assist switch maybe isn't my favorite cause it still is tough to kind of push the buttons, but at least you have buttons. It's clean. It's really neat. Like, there's not really a lot of, uh, you know, if we talk about Fazua's Ride 60 system that we've talked about having a little bit of room for improvement, mm -hmm. this is refinement <clears throat> kind of at its peak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, maybe the only thing I'm looking at over there is the, the wire to the controller could just be like attached to the dropper post line a little sleeker, you know, like everything yeah. was... It could be wireless. I mean, that exists nowadays with other systems, and that would push this further into that. It kind of just looks like a mountain bike. Yep. True. Yeah, no, it's – they. you can tell they did – like they put the time and effort into what they created. Um, mm -hmm. And it's super – yeah, I mean, it's – super natural feeling really quiet when i went down like when i even turned the motor completely off and pedaled it it felt like one of the only bikes that i wouldn't hate life had the battery died yeah and in my experience of the battery dying <laughs> i would yeah, agree you tested that. i would agree yeah it wasn't i think it was pretty abrupt so where the buffet went into limp mode at 20 percent, this did it at 10 mm -hmm. and i almost didn't realize it had done it. i mean it seemed like it shut off um but it's still very in the background unfortunately in like a limp mode like it's it becomes like in the background of you think it's off mm -hmm. um, but it's nice that it's not completely off and it does try to stretch it as far as it can but it died on like the steepest climb we did um where you're yeah experience in the buffet it went into limp mode um, but even having it die on that in kind of the worst possible scenario the access shifting that's hardwired to the bike still worked mm -hmm. and in the easiest gear it was yeah I'd be, still a steep hill but like it just felt like a steep hill it didn't feel like a steep hill with a 20 pound pack on yeah. or something yeah I, totally. i'd be curious to see how the battery performance does in an area where you're maybe not pedaling up and doing laps and you're more doing like a big cross country loop with ups and downs, maybe a little bit <clears> less, <throat> you know, I maybe like what you said, some of those punchier steep stuff like burnt motor goes into a higher torque that starts to suck power down faster. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. you know, there's mm -hmm. the ideal world for this maybe is not the trails that we were riding. Um, but yeah. that being said, like, yeah, motor, motor battery interface combo the the fact that makes it an e-bike was really nicely implemented yeah mm -hmm. yeah i think the only kind of knock for me is that i thought the zoo's system had more power mm -hmm. and that's one of the more popular systems out there right now it does have 10 newton meters more power so it should feel like that but it was enough to be like okay like this tq system is a couple of years old now I feel like the next evolution is probably coming. Same comes with same goes with battery size. Like this has a 360 watt hour battery compared to the 430 and all the Fazua bikes, and that kind of showed looking at our battery used on our test loop. Like 
this was more in that mid 20s range of percent use for the lap versus all of Fazua bikes were like 15%. So you're going to get less range out of this bike. It feels like a little bit less power to me. So kind of overall, it's a bit weaker e-bike package. But at the same time, shifting that towards just kind of what this bike is, like it's way more of a trail bike to me. And that has its benefits in climbing and descending, depending on what you apply it to. But it like, like the whole like small lightweight package fits what the bike's kind of intended use is really well. Yeah. And I think those batteries will kind of like better cell technology will be yeah. kind of the solution to where you can maybe yeah. fit a 430 watt hour battery in it. It would, mm-hmm. that would just round that out yeah. to be pretty much perfect. I think. Yeah. Like this bike isn't dated by any means, mm-hmm. but it has a, a, you know, quite a few of the bikes we tested here have come out after it launched. It's on the cusp of like that stuff happening. Yeah. But for when it came out way ahead and still mm-hmm. very ahead of, I think for in terms of the, integration and the user interface yep it's about as good as it gets yeah and yeah i mean you you got the trek dealers if you have any issues you know i mean i haven't owned a trek in years but like i know that they have pretty deep relationships with their dealers and like most likely any issues that would come up would hopefully be addressed pretty quickly by them yep um Mm -hmm. So yeah, like in fr- on that front, I feel like my money is like safer. Yeah, it's a safer, it's a safer investment Don't. because you're buying a new piece of technology, and we all know how technology <laughs> likes to have issues down the road, yeah. um, especially on something that's like outside, seeing rain and dirt and water and all those yeah. things. So and having worked at a Trek dealer and seen the issues they've had, like it seems like they've addressed a lot of those just in the like frame construction and mm-hmm. stuff. It seems a lot more robust and a lot more, like you said, of a safe investment aside from just the motor technology. Like it seems like you'll have to visit the dealer less as well. What do you guys think about like the value of this bike? It also comes in at 10 grand, like a couple of other bikes we tested. Yeah. GX at 10 grand is I guess normal for an e-bike. Um, but they offer so many different Mm -hmm. build kits, two different frame material options like Mm -hmm. carbon and aluminum. Yeah. I think it's like at a lot of different levels. Yeah. At a lot of different levels, (laughs) Mm -hmm. which is cool. You're like, maybe I don't care about a carbon frame, but I want to get some nicer parts. That's cool. And if you want, you know, as good as it gets, they, they have that too. So something for everyone is yeah. Something to be said for that. Yep. Yeah. I would say, I would say when you're looking at the prices of the other bikes, um, I think it has good value. I think, uh, it's expensive, but it's refined. It's they've, they did their homework. I think it looks great. Um, I don't think the, like you said, it's a trail bike. It had, you know, it might not be like the build that I would purchase, but, um, yeah, I think it was a ton of fun. Um, I really liked it. I liked it more than I thought I would. Mm -hmm. So, and Yeah. yeah. And you're getting a really, really good suspension platform that pedals well, it breaks well, um yeah know, let's get into like maybe climbing trail. performance i think it's more applicable to this bike than maybe any of the other ones because of that trail focus mentality we would all agree that it's way more forward like body positioning in general even cl- but especially climbing like your your my headspace riding this bike was more like i want to go on an adventure because mm-hmm. i have <laughs> a motor that can take me there and i'm on a bike that's has like more broad abilities where the other bikes were the motor was a means to an end to get to Mm -hmm. a descent yes like and i think we're very descent focused people yeah and so we're we're putting that in the priority Mm -hmm. i don't think this is like a descent focused bike i think this is like if you live somewhere i think this is one of the few bikes that somewhere in the southwest a little bit flatter a little bit rockier Mm -hmm. Um, you're not going to have the disadvantages of a heavier bike when you're trying to hop up things or get the back wheel over big ledges and the power delivery. If you do have to, like when you are hopping it up a ledge is so smooth that you're not getting that like kind of torque on off feel of like the motor Mm -hmm. sensing it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if I were to go ride, yeah, like South mountain in Arizona, Utah, some of those places, I think this would almost be the bike I pick first for that stuff. Yep. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, it's it's very specific 
com- for a certain person compared to a lot of the other bikes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think like you said, like we're very descent focused. So we're kind of just like, what's the quickest way to the top? Not mm-hmm. what's going to round out the ride. I think if your ride has a higher overall speed, not just like higher descent speed, a high, it rewards a higher cadence yes. on both ends. Where if you're in the low end of the torque, you're not taking a ton of the battery. Like you're not drawing a ton of power. But when you exceed the max speed of the motor, you don't feel it. It just continues and you can do a longer distance ride more efficiently Mm -hmm. and yeah yeah i think for for, for climbing performance it was yeah maybe not the bike for here but descending i feel like it was exactly the type of bike i would ride here Mm -hmm. um just yeah its priorities didn't really match up i guess with what we were prioritizing um in this instance and then Mm -hmm. but like descending it was awesome Mm -hmm. i was surprised at first i kind of anticipated just based on like bar height was kind of low and how kind of mellow the power is like, maybe it's going to be a little like stood up and like hard to ride through the rough stuff but mm-hmm. i thought it did awesome cornered really well tons of confidence like really good bike but i think yeah we're descent focused so i'd probably put taller bars on it yeah totally i mean if it's you know trek has their their fuel ex mm-hmm. and this is the e version of that and mm-hmm. it's like a incredible execution of that goal to me mm-hmm. like with that bike the non e-bike version of the fuel you can kind of take anywhere and ride on anything and it's mm-hmm. going to be really enjoyable going up the climbs going across the hill and going back down and this is just a little bit more amplified version of that like i totally agree going down maybe when you first kind of look at it or you hop on it you're like oh it's going to be less confidence inspiring and mm-hmm. more demanding moments and I didn't really find it like the suspension platform is epic like it's so good you can just like smash stuff braking's really good and um i like i like the fact that you could get this bike and apply it to like a real variety of terrain which mm-hmm. if you're spending a lot of money on e-bike that is probably something you could look at like it's a good angle to look at it as like it's a bike you're going to be able to use in a lot of different aspects yeah, absolutely. And it has like a lot of use cases. I think some mm-hmm. notes that I kind of had is like, this is a really like perfect tool if you're riding, you know, if you're riding with someone who's fitter than you, mm-hmm. um, but on an, on a regular human powered bicycle, um, because that motor doesn't feel one, it's not noisy, you blend mm-hmm. in Two the power delivery is not so much that you're like going to drop that person on the regular bike. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's like almost a place for this in like a partner situation Mm -hmm. in like a family situation where like, if I want to go ride with my, you know, mom or my dad, Mm -hmm. like something like that. Um, or even just like, you know, someone who's kind of, traveling around just riding all kinds of different trails or yeah mellower yeah, stuff yeah. like quintessential it, trail bike exactly and it can get pretty aggressive and i think just to touch on the looks it's one of the few bikes where like i've seen this next to a fuel ex and had to really look to notice the difference and For i think sure. that's awesome i think this is the bike i was most excited to ride actually because of that i was like i'm curious mm-hmm. how close it is to the normal fuel ex yeah yeah and this is a bike that you could Theoretically, you can drop the battery with taking two bolts out. You could treat it like the transition yeah, relay. I'm not sure if they recommend that, but yeah, you know, I'm gonna I, go ahead and assume you yeah. can if you can take it <laughs> I out. Think but I think there's <laughs> even like another use case. You were talking about adventuring. Um, I've done a little bit of that in my day, but um, <laughs> some some places are like. You're riding a logging road or like some, you're trying to get to a destination, not so much like trying to experience the ride, but just like trying to get somewhere. And this is super efficient at that. And then also like you could potentially ride it if you were trying to go real far, ride it as an acoustic bike, but knowing that maybe you have a super steep bit of like a thousand foot climb to get to some peak and then you bust on the motor rip up the steep grade and you're yeah. there kind of thing yeah, so there's like plan it out accordingly. yeah there could be some like really yeah mo- like different use cases coming from all downhill backgrounds in this room we have this mm-hmm. sort of yeah view of what we like to do mm-hmm. and but uh, to be fair we all pedal a ton we do so yeah yeah you yeah. know like not to be lost on the um 
you know, advantages of having a trail bike and especially one like this that you add in the e-component and like you're talking, there's like more avenues opened up because of that. So mm-hmm. um, it's super versatile. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's probably the key takeaway. Yeah. I guess to address the elephant in the room, the one piece bar and stem didn't bother me as much as I thought it would. It just kind of locks you into like a stack height that I would not run personally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, the sweep of it felt good. It didn't feel as abrasive as the giant one piece bar and stem just like didn't the, the sweep felt more natural, but it did put you in a very forward low position, which is great for climbing, great mm-hmm. for technical slower terrain and like even just flatter. Mm-hmm. It matches spinning. the bike. It matches the bike. But I, yeah, agreed. If I wanted to like be able to have the confidence to hit some bigger features that I know the bike is capable of, it needs that shorter stem with yeah. the, well, not even a short stem, just, just the higher, higher bar, bars yeah. and something with like a bit of roll because it has a lot of these one piece bar stems have like a bit of up sweep and like just kind of a funky, they're, they're meant to be in a seated position. Yeah. And I think if you're going to go as far as to do a whole one piece bar stem combo with how much integration there is for like e-bike specific bars, make the cables disappear at least like find mm-hmm. a way to do that. I know yeah. people hate headset routed cables, but mm-hmm. I'll have no problem with headset routed wires. <laughs> The Nevo Peak is the first new model from RE Bikes, the brand formerly known as Fazari, and it is the lightest e-bike the Utah-based company has ever made. With promising features and an attractive frame design, the Nevo Peak looks to signify the brand's refined new image. Prioritizing the lightweight end of the SL category, the Nevo Peak was the second lightest bike in our test and the lightest Fazua-powered bike in the group, coming in at 42.8 pounds. Vizua's Ride 60 system offers one of the best power to weight ratios, delivering 60 newton meters of torque and 450 watts of peak power at just 4.3 pounds. The Nebo Peak's manageable weight made for a natural feeling on the trail and helped optimize battery life with enough assistance to take the edge off even the steepest climbs. The Ride 60 system has three assist levels, Breeze, River, and Rocket, which are selected via a handlebar mounted ring controller. Corresponding color-coded lights on the top tube mounted display indicate the current mode and display battery life. For more in-depth information, the Ride Control app displays battery life as a percentage, allows personalization of each assist mode, and enables riders to create riding profiles to optimize power delivery for their needs. Geometry numbers have been kept within reason, but should pair well with a wide variety of riders and terrain types. Still, the numbers reflect some great gravity focus attributes and appropriately match the 140 millimeters of rear-wheel travel and 150 millimeter fork. Chainstay lengths measure 434.6 millimeters across all sizes. The head tube angle sits at 65 degrees and the seat tube angle is at 77 degrees. A geometry flip chip located in the chainstay pivot enables mixed or full 29 inch wheels. Flipping from the short setting into the long setting extends chainstay length by 5 millimeters and reduces the head tube and seat tube angles by half a degree. Ari offers a Nebo Peak in four build kits ranging from $6,200 to $10,000. A frame only kit is available for $5,000 with the option to add a RockShox Lyric Ultimate Fork for an additional $800. All build kits feature the same full carbon frame with thoughtfully placed molded frame protection and fully guided internal cable routing. We tested the $8,000 pro level build kit, making the Nebo Peak the cheapest bike in the test. Build highlights include RockShox Ultimate Suspension, SRAM EXO Transmission Drivetrain, the all new SRAM Maven Ultimate Brakes, and DT Swiss XM1700 wheels, a build that leaves little to be desired. Prices are subject to change as usual, and Ari currently has a few models on sale, so hit their website for the most accurate pricing. The Nebo Peak just squeaked its way into our test sessions after launching at the beginning of March. One of the newest additions to the SL category, its clean colorway and banging component spec had us eager to see how it would perform on trail. Alrighty, we are getting closer to approaching the lightest bike of this test. We got the second lightest bike, uh, Ari's very newly released Nebo Peak and another Fazua bike another bike with 140 mils of rear travel 150 up front and uh this was a very interesting bike it has everything about how it looks is very appealing to me like it's 
got the lightweight package kind of on lock, you know, like with Fazua's system applied to this kind of travel bike and their approach with it. I was really excited to ride it. Um, you know, we're three for three now with Fazua systems kind of gone over it a few different times, but you know, again, it's a great, great, uh, package for OEMs to pick from. Um, ring controller sort of has its limitations, but the interface is great. The feet of power is great. And I thought it fit this bike super well. Yeah. I think for motor performance, it's kind of like we had touched on. It's kind of like the, the best of both worlds. In my opinion, it's mm -hmm. 430 watt hour battery with 60 newton meters of torque. And just like the other bikes, two bars of battery gone after a couple hours of riding with quite a bit of climbing. And yeah, I think, my favorite system of the ones we tested. Um, and on this bike, it seems like it's been around long enough. They figured out a way to implement it like in a really tidy kind of clean way that didn't rattle dead silent. Like I didn't get any weird noises out of the bike. Um, one of the quieter motors and just, yeah, still needing a bit of refinement. But like mm -hmm. I said, they kind of, it's been out for a bit and I think already did a great job of kind of, figuring out the best way to implement it into a bike that made sense. And they came out with something yeah, really cool. Yeah. yeah. Like for their first step into this lightweight space, it's a yeah. great option. And one like little thing I liked is how the charging port is really tucked away, kind of mm -hmm. like by that lower link. Um, it just, I guess on one hand, it maybe is a little bit harder to access in some regards, but aesthetically it just tucks away nicely because when you, when you glance at this bike, kind of like the fuel exe you're not really sure if it is an e-bike mm -hmm. you know the everything size wise of the tubes and whatnot match really well mm -hmm. um yeah not much more to say about the motor over here yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. i'll just say like from the looks again like yeah. the fuel exe was probably the bike i was most excited to read for that reason mm -hmm. until i saw this bike and i was like wow that's the same thing hardly mm -hmm. looks like an e-bike Maybe it has down tube storage or something. That's kind of yeah. become normal for tubes uh -huh. to be that size. Yeah. They're not huge and yeah. really well tucked away. Totally. And and like props to Ari for that because usually when I look at a bike that is this cleanly laid out and it seems thought through on just so many different little things, you think about bigger brands. You think of Specialized, Trek, Santa Cruz, those <clears> sort of <throat> brands. So it is really cool with their whole rebranding to see a bike that they kind of launched the rebranding with that I think we all saw it. And we're like, oh, that thing looks pretty sick. Huge step in the right direction. Yeah, yeah. totally, totally. Um, all right, moving on to that. Uh, this bike's probably up there for the best value. It is the cheapest. You get banging parts with it and really nice parts in all the right places. The downside like that with any direct-to-consumer bike is – uh, you're interacting with the brand for assistance, which I think nowadays is maybe less of a negative because a brand like Ari has a lot of systems in place to help you if you yeah, need they've been assistance. been for like 20 years or so. Yeah, and they've been leaning into that uh, that sales program or layout, whatever you want to call it, for like a long time. Mm -hmm. So um, Well versed in that space. Yeah. I mean, They're it's figuring set. it out for sure. Yeah, like yeah. I don't look at this bike and – think that it needs anything else to add to it and everything all the parts on it make it a very like capable trail sle bike another safe investment so to speak yeah. totally yeah they took i mean you know to be fair they're not reinventing the wheel here they took like a very established frame design established suspension design mm -hmm. um they kind of just listen to what's working around and just like implemented all those things. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that, you know, like, yeah, looking at this, like nothing stands out to me, to me, other than the fact that, like you said, it, you almost can't tell it's an e-bike. Mm -hmm. um, the G, you know, the geo numbers of the frame were maybe a bit more upright to me than some of the other bikes. Um, mm -hmm. Or at least some of the bike, like, Less progressive. Yeah. More and like it's, typical of a bike of this travel. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Just just very like middle of the road in a good way. Like if mm. that makes sense. You it's know? Like highly adaptable to a lot of uses and terrain types. Absolutely. Like, you know, we kind of pigeonholed the track into a more trail bike 
zone and then we've pigeonholed like the or not pigeonhole but we've categorized the transition as like a more free ride aggressive bike and this feels like kind of in the middle of those right like it could go do either or like it's obviously light um mm -hmm. and it's obviously capable but yeah it's it just seems like well-rounded but like yeah. mm -hmm. to me not super exciting in any way but that's yeah, like not a bad thing yeah right? it achieves the goal of like what a trail bike is and yeah it's for a sure. great to see yeah. that it's as light as it is for an SL e bike yeah, yeah like i think if we are calling you know the fuel ex e more trail bikey i do put this more similar to that mm -hmm. um but i got on this bike and felt like i could push it harder than i could the fuel it gave me tall stack a lot yeah a lot of it yeah. is just kind of comes down to component and weight in particular and stuff, yeah. yeah like in particular just co uh cockpit like spec you know yeah. and but like all that to be said that uh for a 140 150 bike i wouldn't limit its abilities in my mind to what you would typically expect a bike of that travel amount to be capable of like i i thought it was because it's so light um it's a very easy bike to influence as you ride down the trail. And when you want the bike to be more calm and stable, it could provide that also. Maybe not at the degree of some of the more capable bikes in this test, but at a level that I was like, this bike's sick. Like I would ride it on a lot of stuff. I think it's capable in more directions. Mm -hmm. Like when you say more capable, it's almost like, yeah, the capability towards like the aggressive end. And like Lear said, this is very in the middle mm -hmm. and touches on the spectrum is wide. Yeah, it touches mm -hmm. on like more ends of the spectrum yep. where in my experience on the, on the super rough trail, like pushing into that aggressive riding category, it didn't really get away from me, but it kind of made it known like, yeah, the angles are steeper. Mm -hmm. You kind of don't have as much room for error, but it was very easy to just kind of calm down and let yeah. it do its thing and i thought it felt awesome on the rough trail yeah like because then those little kind of intricacies on the trail are then opened up more than on an aggressive bike that we kind of just mow over them mm -hmm. particularly the little little gaps between railroad ties and such like were super easily attainable mm -hmm. with this yeah 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 the uh and too just you know because travel amount obviously isn't everything and even just like head tube angles and everything like the way i sat on the bike was sick it was like yeah. so sat in the bike a little bit more like pushed back like in that in that position that if something crazy happens you're probably gonna be able to manage whatever is going on mm -hmm. um i wouldn't put it it still was below like the heckler sl and like the cannondale to me like those bikes and really even this the the levo, levo sl, SL yeah. like yeah. those bikes were a little notch above but I think that that and this bike, similar to the Fuel EXE, starts to have uh, broader abilities more in like the versatility side versus just descending, you know? Totally. Yeah, yeah and it was difficult because I rode this bike first and I mm -hmm. found it kind of hard to top. Mm -hmm. Like I rode the Cannondale right after it, which is pretty far in terms of geo. Mm -hmm. It's a mullet. I get along, tend to get along with full 29 more. And it really wasn't until the Heckler SL where I felt like something had topped it in mm -hmm. my mind. Yeah. Um, you know, as a well-rounded bike, like I think the Heckler is still a very well-rounded bike that lets you go slightly more aggressive. Mm -hmm. But I felt, like you said, body position, weight distribution mm -hmm. on the bike was incredible. And yeah, it, it kind of sat at the top for a while until I got to the the Heckler SL and eventually the, the Levo SL. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I feel like we were talking at one point where we all – are deciding between the Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz Heckler and the Specialized Levo SL is like which one we like most, and then this is kind of like the Nebo Peak is Just right below that. Yeah. Like it's, it's in the same group. You can but, and then and then you throw in a price like yeah. seven yeah. grand, and you're and you're like <laughs> reality sets that's or eight that's grand. A, that's yeah. an entry level carbon, right? And you're like, like oh, okay, ultimate maybe. everything, yeah. in it, basically. And you know, we're talking about like some of these bikes being like good for entry level people or good for expert level people. And it's like that, this bike just fits such a wide spectrum. If you're like, yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, it's going to be hard to not be happy with it. I think at the price you pay, I think, yeah, like it starts to scare me because it's almost like too good to be true in the sense that like, how did they save two pounds over a heckler? 
Mm -hmm. you know um and if it is if it is this confidence inspiring like uh, yeah am i gonna push the structural integrity yeah am i gonna push this frame beyond maybe what it's designed for because the geo is so but to be fair from like us riding all the bikes back to back i never got on this and and had any of those thoughts i never right. was like "Ooh, yeah. it's noodly or it's too flex no no not at, not at all not at all totally but i totally agree you look at you look at how the weights land and is there helium in the down too yeah. what's going on <laughs> it's a weird magic trick you pulled yeah. here Ari. Yeah. um yeah no i think that's great it is it is a very uh broad bike in both user and you know, intended use and how you could use the bike. Specialized was one of the first brands to venture into the lightweight e-bike segment with the first generation Levo SL back in 2020. From the get-go, they challenged how light you can make an SL e-bike. Most would agree the first Levo SL went a little too far, compromising stability and confidence to save a few grams via subpar components. Regardless, they helped create the expectation for an e-bike that can ride pretty darn close to a mountain bike and still help push you uphill. When the second generation Levo SL debuted last year, Specialized came out swinging yet again, offering a more powerful motor, relaxed geometry, an updated frame design, and trail rated components. Between SL generations, Specialized launched the now wildly successful Stump Jumper Evo. Realizing that they had struck gold with the Stumpy, they used the same blueprints to develop the latest Levo SL. In fact, the geometry is nearly identical, achieving increased descending stability, better rider centric sizing, and improved comfort climbing. Adjustability was at the center of the Levo SL's new geometry package. The head angle can be set in one of three positions with different headset cups, while a flip chip in the shock eyelet adjusts the bottom bracket by plus or minus five millimeters. Additionally, a flip chip in the horse link enables a 27.5 or 29 inch rear wheel. The bike comes stock with a 27.5 inch rear wheel, the neutral headset position, and the lower bottom bracket height, giving the Levo SL a 64.6 degree head tube angle, 75.8 75.8 degree effective seat tube angle, and a 432 millimeter chainstay length. This is the way that we tested the bike as we never felt the need to make any adjustments. The Levo SL has 150 millimeters of rear wheel travel paired with a 160 millimeter fork. The horse link suspension design no longer uses the asymmetric sidearm brace found on the first generation frame. Shocks are custom tuned by Specialized's own Ride Dynamics team to match the kinematics of the bike and each frame size receives a unique carbon layup to optimize stiffness and weight while achieving a similar ride quality. Powering the Gen 2 Levo SL is Specialized's all-new Turbo SL 1.2 motor that was co-developed with Broza. Delivering 320 watts of peak power and 50 newton meters of torque, the Levo SL shares last place with Trek's Fuel AXE when it comes to raw motor torque, but offers slightly more peak wattage. The motor is paired with a 320 watt hour integrated battery, making it the smallest capacity battery in the test. A 160 watt hour range extender is sold separately, which would put the Levo SL on par with the battery size of the other bikes in the test, but it'll cost you $450. Integrated into the top tube is Specialized's turbo control unit, which remains one of the cleanest and most well executed EMTB data displays. It acts as a one stop shop for most mid ride information, including assist mode, battery life, speed, distance, cadence, elevation, heart rate, and power. Eco Trail and Turbo remain the default assist modes and each can be refined within the Mission Control app to meet individual rider needs. The Levo SL can also be ridden in micro tune mode, which gives assist amounts in 10% increments. Specialized offers four Levo SL builds ranging from $8,000 to $15,000. Sizes range from S1 to S6 and all builds come with the same motor and battery, except for the S-Works model, which also includes a range extender. The only anomaly between sizes is an S1 or extra small equivalent uses a 150 millimeter fork. We tested the Pro build that retails for $12,000 and our size S5 test bike weighed 41 pounds. This made the Lebo SL the lightest and most expensive bike in the test. Pro build highlights include a Fox Factory 36 fork and float shock, Carbon Traverse HD wheels, SRAM code silver brakes, and a SRAM Exo Eagle transmission drivetrain. As a staple and pioneer in the SL space, it's tough not to use the Levo SL as a benchmark against which to gauge other bikes. But the competition never sleeps. So it was exciting coming into this test knowing that while Specialized had positioned the latest Levo SL to again take the reins on the SL category, other bikes have been developed based on the standard it set in the hopes of beating it. 
the lightest bike at the test, the most expensive bike at the test, specializes Levo SL. This is definitely a staple and pioneer in the SL space. So it's tough not to compare all the other bikes we've been riding against Levo SL as it's kind of a benchmark. So let's get right into just talking about its motor system. It's the it's unique to itself and uh, it's tied with the Trek as being the lowest uh, torque provided at 50 Newton meters. So what'd you guys think of it? Yeah, the motor feels really good. Um, doesn't like hit super hard. It kind of rolls on nicely, but the lack of torque becomes apparent when you hit like a steep uphill. Mm -hmm. um, you kind of just have to adjust to thinking more of like riding a normal bike with a little extra speed, I feel like, similar to the Trek. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. It's not the quietest, but not as loud as like a full power bike, obviously. Um, yeah, I think from just a performance standpoint, though, it's it's really good. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I like I liked it a lot. I thought it was really smooth. Um, I think it almost. I mean, I know you jumped back and forth on them a little bit more than me. My mm. first impression coming from the. I can't even say it now. The foie joie, dude. Fazua. Fazua motor. No, we've been joking around too much. It took the whole the whole recording and you finally messed it up. Yeah, I know. That's the last beer. The Fazua motor. <laughs> um, comparing the two, like I felt that it was almost a smoother experience with the Specialized than the Fazua. Okay. Um, but I didn't jump on them back and forth like you did. I definitely noticed it didn't have the torque that the Fusua had and maybe that's where the smoother experience comes from you know you're just putting more input in but then and also being the lightest bike your input does the most to the bike right so mm -hmm. there's there's a few factors going in there but um yeah sound to me was like kind of in the middle maybe more towards yeah like similar to the Fusua, like just different tone mm -hmm. um the Fusua, yeah like you don't hear the Fazua when you're on it, but you hear it when other people are on it more. Yeah. The Specialized you hear when you're on it, maybe not as much when other people aren't. Like the, the tone doesn't the carry, pitch the pitch doesn't yeah. carry as far. So it's like a different, it's just a different frequency, which mm -hmm. is kind of interesting. Um, but then like the user interface of the Specialized is very refined. It's kind mm -hmm. of everything I would want from an e-bike and nothing I don't want. Um, and yeah, I like, I like that form factor and the little screen on the top tube, it's not so big, you know, the Trek is super sexy with how sleek it is, but it also to me is like someone's brake lever is going to crack that screen so quickly. It's like this, I need a screen protector. I need a phone <laughs> case for my screen on my bike. Uh -huh. Um, the specialized <laughs> feels a little more robust, a yeah. little bit smaller, less to damage. Um, with like maybe less information, but the information that you want. And then I, I, I personally like the 10% increments of power adjustment yep, because it's just like more how my brain thinks. Um, mm -hmm. It's like shifting. Exactly. More we, similar to it. Yeah. We're used to that. So um, yeah, they, you know, it's like, it's not the best at anything, but it's like very refined feeling. And I, f mm -hmm. I feel like it's hard not to be happy with it. Um, yeah. yeah, I would, I would agree. It, it, it has a similar feel in the way it delivers power to the TQ system, which has that same refinement feel. And it's just natural. It's natural. Mm -hmm. It's consistent. You're not, um, yeah, you're not really surprised by the power it provides in most situations. Um, this one was unique cause I rode this bike when it launched, uh, about a year ago and I loved this bike for a lot of reasons and it was cool to ride this motor system again with the Fazua system because that is so popular now in the SL space and riding them back to back in like hundred foot increments on the same climb. So like very rapid back and forth, the motor feels like it has more drag to me with the, uh, SL motor on specialized. Like it, it, uh, is maybe more mechanical feeling. Like I don't really have anything to back up what that feeling is, but there's just a little bit more vibration compared to Vizua. Mm -hmm. And it's almost kind of like, 
it reminds me of pedaling with like a chain guide in like a weird way. Like that's the closest to describe it. You're not feeling like the top, you're not feeling like the feedback of the tire on the ground on your pedals. Mm -hmm. It's being like transmitted through transmitted the drive through train. the motor. Yeah. And that's like kind of giving you this like hum yeah. to your feet kind of thing. Yeah. Like I rode both bikes, with the motor off. And from a drag standpoint there is, you can't, I could not pick which one had less or more drag. It is mm -hmm. just like a feeling thing. But kind of that was one aspect. It definitely feels like it has just less juice to get you up steep climbs to me than the Fazua system. I know it mm -hmm. has less power. It should feel that way. But I got on it and I was like, dang. In Getting my dropped. mind, for riding this bike like a year ago, <laughs> yeah. I was like, yeah, it's sick. It's an SL bike. Like it's got good power, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, it feels under power now compared to kind of like what it, this Fazua system that's out there a lot. And um it felt to me like riding this bike your cadence window to be fed the most efficient power was a bit smaller where fazua had had some like weird kind of curve like, yeah weird curves at the beginning of how yeah, yeah, yeah like it hit quick and then it kind of dropped out if you didn't keep giving it the power but like from that point on once you match the cadence it kept ripping and you could just kind of like flutter in different zones yeah the specialized, you have to like, for me, it's like a small window to have, be maximizing the power on hand. Mm -hmm. And outside of that, you can feel that you're like bogging down. And that yeah, was interesting. Or like topping out, did you notice? Yeah, like it was, I noticed it more on the climb I compared it on was like a fairly steep, consistent grade. And mm -hmm. so like I was more at a, trying to be at a higher cadence. And I straight up was just in a, lower gear on the specialized than i was on the fazua bike mm -hmm. to get that same feeling of like the motor's helping me up this not i'm fighting the motor to be getting something out of it up the climb yeah. which was interesting yeah i felt like i would get to a higher cadence but be kind of going nowhere feeling but mm -hmm. it's less power i mean it makes yeah. sense it's yeah, yeah. lower lower um peak watts mm -hmm. and less torque i yeah. believe slightly yeah. but the trade-off is like the weight reduction is insane like it mm -hmm. feels I read a stump jumper Evo every day and picking this up, it's so similar. Yeah. It's I know. Awesome. Like, yeah. It's for that. Totally. And it was probably my second favorite bike out of everyone. Mm -hmm. And then the moment for that reason. Yeah. The moment, like, you know, what you're explaining, you're feeling, you know, it was a very steep grade mm -hmm. road, um, which the, the motor is going to have the most influence on how that climbs. Right. Yeah. Um, bringing, that bike to something that's more of a technical single track climb with like flat brakes yep. and like little ledges mm -hmm. and things like that. All of a sudden I feel like this bike might feel like less effort because mm -hmm. you're able to pick it up over stuff and it has that smoother power transfer once the rear wheel leaves the ground and then catches mm -hmm. the ground again and you're back on the pedals. Mm -hmm. That was a standout characteristic. Like pedal kicking was like seamless pretty much. And it's the 10% ten, ten increments let you really like, ensure that you're not going to have an issue mm -hmm. where some bikes like the Fazua and others have a yeah. bit of a delay. So it's just different. Not yeah. to say mm -hmm. that it's like, yeah. 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 No, it's an interesting one because I do agree. Like it's still the power exists in that nice background feeling where to think about it. But to your point, for sure, in maybe more sustained climbs where you have that opportunity to hone in on your cadence and maximizing the power at hand, like it felt a little bit more touchy to getting that, but in those more technical situations, like yeah. yeah, like in the more technical situations, the, this bike rides the most similarly to a mountain bike to me. Of course it's the lightest, but it's like the, some of the means like the, the bike itself literally rides like a stump jumper Evo. It's mm. like actually crazy. Think, and so climbing, like even though maybe the motor in some situations I felt had to be catered to, the bike's light you can like approach a climb the same way you might and the power is still there it's just i mean, I don't know i think from riding it when it launched i was uh kind of disappointed the second go around to be like oh this thing's not as like giving me that like punch and power mm -hmm. like the fazua now can provide you in a lightweight package so mm -hmm. i think and i think a lot of people that have ridden specialized sl bikes that are out there probably are wondering why the heck they don't have a more powerful SLE bike right now. Like mm -hmm. everybody else is climbing and now this is tied for last with Trek 
on power. So it's yeah. probably going to be evolved. At well, some and point. if you don't know about those like micro adjust modes, I mean, I felt mm-hmm. like trail and boost kind of blended together. Mm-hmm. Eco is like quite a bit lighter. Mm-hmm. So there's a big gap there. Yeah. But yeah. once I figured out that micro adjust mode or the, mm-hmm. the percentages, I felt like the full hundred percent power improved the response quite a bit. And mm-hmm. I felt like, okay, now I'm like obviously closer. Cause I think boost gets you to 90%, mm-hmm. not a hundred. Mm-hmm. And so going to a hundred felt more like what I was expecting it to feel like right off the bat. Mm-hmm. So it's worth noting if you haven't dove into that. It's yeah. Yeah. Very yep. helpful. On um, the, yeah. And the climbing thing, I think the, the seat angle was like a little bit more slack than some of the other bikes. Uh, I was going to say the same thing. So yeah. it does feel like, yeah. Like when you get on those road climbs that are steep, that mm-hmm. is what this bike maybe is not meant for. You yeah. know, yeah, um, yeah. it just really wants to ride single track all the time. Yeah. And like it was comfortable climb climbing, you know, yeah, right. it's, never, it's, yeah, never it's like an efficient position, it's but a mm-hmm. little more. Yeah. It's just that little further back than some of the other ones. Mm-hmm. And it, this, Not, my saddle height, it was like the front wheel was lifting quite a bit on the really steep ones. I felt like I had short, to fight to keep the wheel down. Yeah, yeah. that short rear end too. Mm-hmm. Um, but that... Which a full 29 could maybe help a little. Potentially. I I loved the short rear end. Like I ride mm-hmm. I like bikes mm-hmm. that have short rear ends. I mean, totally. the moment I got on that thing, I was like bunny hopping it higher, yeah. jumping off every little thing yeah. I could, yeah. hopping over logs. Like it mm-hmm. just yeah. was like super... It wanted to play and go sideways. Put it downhill for sure. Sust- I mean, like mm-hmm. sustained climbing though, I was like, yeah, it's a little more would be nice. But descending, you're, yeah, I absolutely agree. Mm-hmm. It was awesome. Yeah, it complements the entire package as far as like its weight and all those things. Like you tuck in the rear end a little bit more, and you take a bike that is very playful and it just caters to that Mm -hmm. even more so and yeah like obviously we're not overly impressed by the power or the lifespan of the battery but Mm -hmm. as a bike like it's so fun it's sick so you know it once again kind of falling into that category of like if you're a two two to three hour ride after work person like could be Mm -hmm. the ticket to doing your longer loop that maybe you couldn't finish before it got dark yeah yeah and it's uh you know we covered transitions relay in this test and this bike poses kind of an interesting one to me because it's only a pound heavier than that bike with the battery removed and mm. it's like with why, full power from yeah it. not it's full like power, but you know the full yeah. boost mode yeah it's like why not option. why not just get this bike that is like i don't know it's super sick all the time you know the deal with taking super the battery adjustable out. too mm-hmm. like yeah like headset cups two well, wheel options i'll tell you why yeah, it costs twice as much <laughs> <laughs> yeah for sure it's damn expensive yeah <laughs> you can... it costs so much money yeah it even costs... the entry entry level build for <laughs> a levo sl is eight grand wow. so yeah. it uh you know on one hand you are getting maybe one of the most developed bikes mm-hmm from every aspect, you know, like it's yeah, I like wanna, it's dude, like it's built on the stump jumper even. And I want to touch like on like the mountain bike. I ride know? a stump jumper you every day, and the rear suspension on this bike is noticeably better. Mm-hmm. Like just from you know, it's I don't think there's a big enough weight difference to be like, oh, it's the weight of the bike. Mm-hmm. I don't think so. I thought the rear suspension does everything I wish my stumpy Evo would do. Yeah. Well, the last specialized that I rode was our S five. Enduro. Enduro at the last or the Enduro, Enduro test, test sessions yeah. and this is an S5, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. This bike feels so good to me and that other bike was like my least favorite. Yeah. So it's such Which a that, dr- ass comparison. Yeah. I mean, yeah. obviously sizing shifts, mm-hmm. so many things have changed, but like it is yeah and and i get along better with like a more playful bike that has more rider input which this is more on that side of the spectrum than the enduro obviously mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. it yeah like yeah. i've i was kind of blown away by how fun just how fun the bike was i couldn't yeah. say that it was like the best descender the most this the most that but it was, it was just like yeah. i was having so much fun on it's it. impressive how good it was though because like I, I was thinking when i first got on it maybe i would even go for an s6 because it is slightly different sizing than the current stump evo i think but after riding it for a while i was like man i yeah if you want to just be stuck to the ground kind of more but it was the ability to get off the ground and just like 
mm-hmm. ride the entire trail that made it so fun. The, yeah. j- the jib lord bike, so to speak. It, it yeah. is, yeah. Neck and I neck mean, with the, the heckler as hell, I think. Like, yeah. It's just the weight advantage, though, like, puts it above it for sure. Yeah. Yeah, and... And then also, yeah. on top of that, just the refinements that Specialized has done with integrating everything. They've and got like, control over that stuff. It's a sexy bike. You know, they've, like, mm-hmm. you don't look at anything and you're like, oh, this could do some work. Like, they totally. Yeah. They've, like, it's, it's hard to poke holes in much of any other details of the bike you know like Mm -hmm. everything everything's pretty sick and like i would give this bike the you get first place for fun factor absolutely yeah Yeah. you know like where the the heckler to me was super fun that bike i would like choose if i somehow found an sl e-bike race to enter in where like (laughs) this bike i would want to ride every day because i could I could go out for a cruiser ride and yeah. just kind of hang out and ride and have fun and whatever. I could also like push my own abilities on it and I know it'll hold up to it. Like it, it has a more, had a more forgiving overall feeling, which made it more appealing to own as a bike where, but also matched with the ability to hold up to when I wanted to really like push some energy yeah. through it and like, you know, go I fast. felt like, the split for me was like if I was going to go on a ride with a group of people on e-bikes mm-hmm. on knowing that on steep climbs, I'm going to get dropped. Mm-hmm. Like for me, this would be if I was going to have one bike, I think I'd be like, yeah, I have the option of a totally normal trail bike mm-hmm. and a trail bike that helps you a bit. So like if, if I'm riding by myself more, this would be kind of yeah my go-to, but with the option to go ride in like groups of people on e-bikes, I'd be like, I want to be, feel like I'm going to stick with the pace, you know, mm-hmm. and maybe that's a full size Levo, but mm-hmm. looking at SL bikes, I think the Fazua just like bridges edged the gap. it out. Yeah. It kind yeah. of bridges the gap. And then where this feels like, yeah, Jib Lord fun factor bike, mm-hmm. the Heckler SL is very, very close, but just mm-hmm. did a little more of that kind of rough terrain better. I thought, um, or just in a different way. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of the, the split there. Yeah. 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 I think you get what you pay for <laughs> in this. You I know? sure hope so. I well, yeah, yeah, I sure hope so too. Um, you know, like or or yeah, you pay for what you get either way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, it's hard to not hard to not like love a lot about this. But I mm-hmm. think coming down to what you said, it's like when we're getting into this SL category, you're splitting hairs, and like you know, this kind of goes into a whole nother conversation. But like who are you riding with and like, what are you, you know, if you're on a bunch, if everyone has the same bike as you, no worries, but that's not necessarily the case all the time. Mm -hmm. Right. So like, how do you categorize when you pull this out of the garage, so to speak? Yeah. Like to me, if you are leaning towards the Levo SL, you're getting that to ride predominantly with people on regular mountain bikes and you're going to tune it back. You are not. Whereas the Fazua bikes we tested or definitely the full power bikes, of course, those bikes you could start to trend towards riding with people on full size e bikes, mm-hmm. but this is this is like straight up a mountain bike that happens to have a motor on it. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. And mm-hmm. I think that's why in my mind it kind of tops the SL category for like what that is gonna eventually kind of separate into. Mm-hmm. I'd say it's leading that charge. And like you said, with the integration of everything, they have control over every component on the bike, more or less. And you're like, Yeah, I wish the the Trek screen had a protector and a phone case that looks like it has a phone case and a protector on it essentially like the design (laughs) the design is like thought out to where it's like yeah that could happen and we thought of that and it's like rubber it's still a high resolution screen that is a little more robust not so flashy Mm -hmm. um yeah super yeah super easy to set up super simple to get going not a lot of confusion in that sense it and they, they do a great job yeah. And for the price, it's like not a bike you're going to replace every year. It's a, it's a long-term investment. And I think that pl- price reflects that. Like they give you a good is, foundation to, to hold on to for a while. Is this battery removable from the frame? No, not easily. Okay. I, I would, in the motor. Yeah, yeah. I would just be curious, like, you know, when you're dropping 12 grand on, a, on one of these bikes, like in the future, I think, you know, if, if geometry has hit this point where we've, think we found something that's really fun like i would love to see them like offering battery upgrades or motor upgrades because at the twelve thousand dollar price point like you obviously have a bike that's super fun to ride 
could probably last you five years plus before you yeah. ever felt like five have, years of us riding it, like they hard do have riding. Range extenders. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so well. the range extender thing, but like, yeah, I mean, if I think that like down the road, like we might mm-hmm. get, you know, in five years, we might have battery technology that could potentially maybe not put that at full size e bike speeds, but like bring the range into yeah, the totally. more four to five hour yeah. zones as opposed to the two to yeah, three sick. hour zones. There's, you know? Yeah, there's, there's no way we don't look back on this test and conversation in a couple of years. And this bike is more powerful with a bigger battery, but is achieving the exact same experience. Yeah. Right. You ever need 20 spacers to change your bar roll? Oh. oh, wow, we're good. You all right? Yeah.